program in support of African nations in this journey. I'm very humbled to be joined today by African and other global leaders who will come forward today to commit and plan action needed to respond to this challenge. Let us waste no more time. Let's go to the first speaker, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and Chairman of the Global Center on Adaptation. Mr. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, you have the floor, sir. Honorable heads of state and government, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be speaking to many of you again today following the Climate Adaptation Summit in January, which I co-chaired with the Prime Minister Mark Root of the Netherlands and with strong support of Dr. Fair Koyen, CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation. We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to build forward better from this COVID crisis. Nowhere is this more critical than in Africa, the continent on the front line of our climate emergency. Climate change is hitting the most vulnerable there the hardest, contributing to food insecurity, population displacement, and stress on water resources. In recent months, Africa has suffered from devastating floods, an invasion of locust, and the looming specter of drought. The human and economic toll continues to rise. We need to urgently prepare Africa, and indeed the whole of humanity, to live with the multiple effects of our warming planet. Climate change did not stop because of COVID-19. Indeed, COVID-19 is our wake-up call. A wake-up call for countries and communities to develop adaptation solutions. To take action to respond to the impacts of climate change that are already here and those which are to come. And so following the summit, the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, developed by the Global Center on Adaptation and African Development Bank, will help us achieve three things. A step change in ambition so that adaptation receives the funding and attention it deserves. A step change in financing to mobilize billions of dollars for a decade of transformation in Africa. And a step change in partnerships and knowledge exchanges to make the best solutions and approaches available to all. Adaptation is vital for meeting our sustainable development goals, especially for Africa. We will not achieve a world of zero hunger unless we help farmers adapt to climate change. This means introducing drought-resistant crops, irrigation methods that save water, planting trees to halt deforestation, data and digital services to provide timely weather alerts, market prices, crop insurance, and so much more. Climate adaptation and development go hand in hand. Each of our 17 sustainable development goals has targets that can be met or enhanced with the right adaptation strategies. The Paris Agreement places equal emphasis on mitigation and adaptation. Both are vitally important, and one should not come at the expense of the other. Developed countries need to honor the commitments as part of the agreement. And today, I'm asking all of you to support the Africa Adaptation 
acceleration program as a vehicle to implement adaptation on the continent. By doing so, you will be saving lives and helping to climate-proof the livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people. Together, we can build a resilient future for Africa. But we really don't have any more time to lose. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, for your very strong words and also your call for bold action on climate adaptation. Well, talking about bold action, what better person to go next than to the President of the African Development Bank, President Adeshina. Mr. President, you are rewarded as the best financial institution of the world. You're leading on climate adaptation. You came forward with a bold plan during the Climate Adaptation Summit. What is your vision of success? What needs to happen on the ground? President Adeshina. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's very clear from the uh, Secretary General of Hawaii, United States Secretary General, uh, Ban Ki-moon. Your Excellency, President Felix Tshisekedi, President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Chairperson of the African Union. Your Excellency Ali Bongo Ondimba, President of Gabon, and African Union Champion of the African Adaptation Initiative. Your Royal Majesties, Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, Your Excellency, Ban Ki-moon, the former United uh, Nations Secretary General, Your Excellency, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, my dear brother, Musa Faki, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, my sister, Kristalina Jajeva, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, my big sister, Ngozi Okojenwela, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, the United States Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, the Chairman of COP26, Right Honorable Alok Sharma of the United Kingdom, Honorable Ministers, Business and Media Leaders, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and all of you joining us from around the world. I welcome you all and thank you immensely for honoring our invitation to this Global Leaders Dialogue on Climate Adaptation for Africa. It is such a huge honor to have over 20 heads of state and governments with us today in what is clearly the largest ever gathering of Global Leaders on Climate Adaptation for Africa. Thank you so much, Your Excellencies. I speak today with all humility and lift my voice to raise an alarm on climate change in Africa. I raise it for our leaders. I raise it for our nations. I raise it for our youth. I raise it for our women. I raise it for our today. And I raise it for Africa's future. Africa, which is the world's least carbon emitter, is facing the worst consequences of the impacts of climate change. 10 of the top 12 countries most at risk of droughts are in Africa. Eight out of the top 12 countries affected by agricultural risks are also in Africa. The percentage of years in which droughts affected more than 2 million people in Africa has increased from 20% to a whopping 90%. The International Monetary Fund estimates that Africa's climate adaptation cost will reach $50 billion by 2040 every year. Yet, Africa does not get the resources it needs to adapt to climate change. Globally, only 10% of climate finance goes into adaptation, and Africa has only received only 3% of global climate finance. We feel, Your Excellencies and leaders, climate change will lead with climate change every day in Africa. Hurricanes Idia and Kenneth that pummeled Mozambique and Zimbabwe and Malawi left over 1,000 people dead and destroyed over $2 billion worth of infrastructure. Droughts have turned a vast part of Africa into parchlands as scorching heat 
dries up rivers and lakes, affecting access to water, navigation, and in fact, triggering conflicts. Africa needs global solidarity on climate change. Solidarity to boost Africa's resources and capacities to adapt to climate change. Solidarity with nations to secure themselves against catastrophic risk events and damage. Solidarity to support millions of fathers who face huge challenges to adapt to changes they did not cause. Solidarity with the youth and women who are bearing the brunt of climate change and lost opportunities for jobs and incomes. From our rural villages to our communities and our sprawling urban cities, there must be climate change solidarity. Our solidarity must translate to decisive actions. The African Development Bank is taking decisive actions. We increase the share of our financing going to climate from 9% in 2016 to 38% in 2019. And we expect to reach 40% by this year. The African Development Bank has far exceeded the call of United Nations Secretary General Guterres for multilateral development banks to devote 50% of their climate finance to adaptation. The bank achieved 50% parity in climate adaptation by 2018. We increased allocation to climate adaptation to 58% by 2019. And by 2020, we devoted 67% to climate adaptation. The African Development Bank's commitment to climate finance we reached $25 billion by 2025. Our financing is going towards support for large-scale climate adaptation initiatives in Africa. The bank is implementing the Desert to Power Initiative to build the world's largest solar zone in the Sahel to provide renewable energy for 250 million people. And work has started in Burkina Faso, Chad, and Mali, working with adjuncts from State of Development. The bank is supporting the Great Green Wall Initiative, a climate defense shield to protect the Sahel from desertification, for which we have committed to mobilize $6.5 billion at the conference called by President Emmanuel Macron. The bank's technologies for African agricultural transformation, which we call TAT or TAAT, is working on the ground in 37 African countries in providing farmers with climate resilient seeds to protect them and help them to adapt to drought, to pests, and diseases. In 2019, we provided 2.6 million farmers with drought tolerant maize to cope with droughts that were ravaging. Eastern Africa countries. In Sudan and Ethiopia, hundreds of thousands of farmers now plant heat tolerant wheat varieties that are rapidly boosting food security. We supported 600,000 farmers in Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Zambia with treated technologies that allow them to survive the massive devastation of the fall army war. The bank's Africa Disaster Risk Insurance Facility helps to pay for insurance for countries to insure themselves against climate-related disasters to build resilience. The African Development Bank, Your Excellencies, and the Global Center for Adaptation have launched the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program to further scale climate adaptation solutions across all African countries. Our goal is to mobilize $25 billion for climate adaptation for Africa. The African Adaptation Acceleration Program will build on what is working and speed up the actualization of the African Adaptation Initiative of the African Union. We plan to provide digital climate information and advisory services for 30 
million farmers. Through our Africa Resilient Infrastructure Accelerator, we plan to mobilize support to scale up climate resilient urban and rural infrastructure, including water, renewable energy, roads, and housing. We will support small island states to build climate resilience. We will mobilize and leverage global finance to support the private sector. We will work to align financial systems in Africa to support climate finance and green investments and to align with the Paris Agreement. And we plan to support one million youth with skills and knowledge for climate adaptation to create much needed green jobs, building 10,000 youth-led climate adaptation businesses. Your Excellencies, we must now raise ambition for climate finance for Africa. Only ambition, scale, finance, and delivery matters. Together, let's mobilize financing for the success of the African Adaptation Acceleration Program. It is time for developed countries to meet their promise of providing $100 billion annually for climate finance. And a greater share of this should go to climate adaptation. Your Excellencies, so far over $20 trillion have gone into COVID-19 stimulus packages in developed economies. The plan of the IMF to issue $650 billion of new SDRs to boost global reserves and liquidity will be enormously helpful to boost fiscal space. It will be even more helpful if developed countries were to agree to allocate a significant share of their own SDRs to developing countries, especially to more vulnerable low-income countries. I wish to applaud the United States, and in particular, the US Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen, for her global leadership on this, as well as the Managing Director of IMF, her sister Kristalina Georgieva. The SDRs can help to also provide resources to boost green growth and climate financing as we build economies back with a triple win with health, economic, and climate resilience. So let's make a big push on expanding fiscal space. As we look, Your Excellencies, towards COP26 in Glasgow, let us make a big push on climate finance and let us make a big, even bigger push on climate adaptation. For it is now high time to massively support climate adaptation finance for Africa. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Well, thank you so much, President Adeshina, um, for your strong leadership on this uh, topic. You raised the alarm, you called for global solidarity, and you put a bold in initiative on the table, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. And we at the Global Center on Adaptation, as your partner on the continent, we're really happy joining you in this effort. You mentioned, uh, Mr. President, Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. She clearly indicated the link between climate risk and financial risk. So let's listen to Kristalina, what her message to Africa is today. Thank you, my dear brother, President Adesina, for inviting me to address you today. Uh, and let me start by congratulating the African Development Bank and the Global Center for Adaptation on the bold and timely Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. It is so important for Africa because as countries face health and economic crisis caused by the pandemic, they're also struggling with the effects of climate change. In practical terms, what should countries do? First, this pandemic has shown us the importance of investing in people. And that is so, so very valuable for Africa, which has a fast growing young population. This begins by improving education, healthcare, 
food security. Uh, and in that context, I warmly welcome the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, including youth leadership initiative to develop skills for climate resilient jobs, as well as your free online global education initiative. Second, resilient infrastructure. It would reduce the impact of climate shocks and provide the foundation for enduring economic growth. Think of irrigation, flood management systems, climate smart agriculture, and schemes like the Build Smart Facility to help advance water projects. In many of these cases, these are job rich investments, and it is so important that there are more jobs uh, for those that are seeking employment. Finally, strengthening social safety nets can create buffers that can compensate for lost income in the wake of climate-induced disasters. To address the current health and economic crisis and the climate crisis, many countries in Africa will need support from the international community. This is critical for the region and for the wider world. For this reason, we are calling for a comprehensive approach that would include domestic and international measures. And I'm very encouraged by the discussions of our membership on a new SDR allocation of $650 billion by addressing the long-term global needs for reserve assets. This allocation would benefit all our members, including in Africa, and it would support a global green recovery from the crisis. It would also be a powerful signal of the IMF's membership on our determination to do everything possible to help our members. Because if we have learned one thing from this crisis, it is the importance of solidarity and cooperation in our interconnected world. Uh, let me conclude. The IMF is firmly committed to helping our members to deal with risks to their economic and financial stability. And this is why we are firmly committed to deal with climate risks. For this reason, we are already stepping up in integrating climate in our economic and financial surveillance, in our capacity development, in our data work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, for your strong leadership uh, at the helm of the fund and also for joining uh, the board of the Global Center on Adaptation. You called for a comprehensive approach for a green recovery. Let's turn to another global leader, Secretary General Antonio Guterres. I think in the last few months, you really have ramping up uh, the United Nations system behind climate adaptation. In fact, you called for a breakthrough on climate adaptation. Sir, what does it mean for Africa? Thank you very much. Excellencies, I thank the African Development Bank and the Global Center for Adaptation for convening us today. As the world confronts a pandemic, a recession, and a climate crisis, the United Nations Climate Conference COP26 in November provides a compelling opportunity for Africa to turn ambition into reality. In that context, it is clear that we need a breakthrough on adaptation. And I'd like to highlight five imperatives for that to be possible. First, I've asked all G7 members and other developed countries, as well as multilateral and national development banks, to increase the share of climate finance allocated to adaptation and resilience to at least 50% of their total climate finance. Today, adaptation and resilience finance accounts for a mere 20% of total climate finance flows. Second, I am calling on all governments and businesses to integrate climate risks into policies and investment decisions, including budget and procurement. And developing countries must be furnished with the tools and means to achieve this. Accurate and up-to-date risk information is the critical first step for effective risk management. Third, we must scale up catastrophe-triggered financial instruments, such as risk pooling mechanisms, the Africa risk capacity merits more investment. And fourth, bilateral and multilateral partners must scale up 
support to regional adaptation and resilience initiatives, such as the Great Green Wall Initiative and the Sahel and Congo Basin Commissions. Finally, fifth, I ask that by COP26, we have concrete proposals on the table to make access to climate finance easier and faster, including for African nations. Support for climate adaptation in Africa is crucial. I encourage all international partners to come forward with pledges to support the African Adaptation and Acceleration Program. African countries continue to contribute little to global emissions, so deep is the continent's energy poverty. Yet Africa is on the front lines of dramatic climate impacts, from floods to cyclones and drought, that can wipe out decades of development gains overnight. And the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us that we cannot afford to ignore known risks. We need large-scale, risk-informed, preventive and systematic adaptation efforts to protect people and communities and to build a high resilience future. Yet, one in three people are not adequately covered by early warning systems. Global coverage, along with sustainable infrastructure and other steps, can give the world a double dividend, avoiding future losses and generating economic gains. The Global Commission on Adaptation found that every $1 invested in adaptation could yield almost $4 in benefits. Adaptations must not be the neglected half of the climate equation. I continue to call on the G20 countries and many meters to lead the way with new and more ambitious national determined contributions, laying out concrete actions and policies for the next 10 years, building a global coalition to achieve net zero greenhouse emissions by 2050, and in line with the objective to limit global temperature rise to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And I'm also urging all countries to align their COVID-19 recovery packages with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to chart a new global development path. The current model is not delivering. Market dynamics have changed profoundly. In 2020, funding for renewables and energy efficiency was four times greater than for fossil energy. Renewable energy solutions employ more than 10,000 formal workers in Kenya, and that number is expected to grow another 70% over the next two years. Yet only 2% of global renewable energy investments in the past decade have gone to Africa, to just a few countries, even though the continent has abundant and untapped renewable resources. The old models of development and energy use have failed to provide universal energy access to Africans. Hundreds of millions of people still struggle every day because they lack reliable and affordable access to electricity or are cooking with polluting and harmful fuels. We can provide universal access to energy in Africa, primarily through renewable energy. And I call for a comprehensive package of support to meet this objective ahead of COP26. It is achievable, it is necessary, it is overdue, and it is smart. Climate action is a three trillion US dollars investment opportunity in Africa by 2030. A just energy transition for Africa is critical, one that recognizes the unique and special situation and circumstances of Africa that include addressing a transitional energy mix. But we face a major finance gap. 14% of the world's population lives in sub-Saharan Africa, yet only 3% of global climate finance flows into the region. The 100 billion US dollars commitment made over a decade ago must be delivered. And I've asked all G7 nations to double their climate finance support and the share of grants. Developed countries and main financiers must ensure a swift sh shift of the billions to support African green investments, to increase resilience, and to create the conditions for scale up private finance. And the private sector must step up and get organized to provide immediate concrete solutions to governments. Local authorities can work with unions and community leaders on reskilling and social security nets. African nations can lead the way by embedding ambitious adaptation and mitigation plans in their updated NDCs. But first, they need to regain their fiscal autonomy. At the high level event on debt and liquidity convened last week, I reiterated my call for an extended, in time and scope, moratorium on debt payments, targeted debt relief or cancellation where appropriate, and reform of the international debt architecture. We need to make sure that the special drawing rights already made available by some countries or that are soon to be issued 
will be applied, providing effective support to the African continent's sustainable and inclusive recovery. Excellencies, as the continent that has contributed least to the climate crisis, Africa deserves the strongest possible support and solidarity. African no nations are showing leadership. The Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program and many other ambitious African initiatives must be empowered to fully deliver on their goals. You can count on my full realization. The UN is strongly committed to working with you, and I emphasize the word with, to secure the support you need to chart a prosperous and sustainable future, and I thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Secretary Guterres. Please rest assured, we're also with you. We're very humbled for your strong leadership on this uh, topic. Turning ambition into reality. Strong support for the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. And a reminder, it's not only the smartest thing to do, but to invest in adaptation is a must do. We need the financial resources. We know, sir, sir that you have to leave us uh, shortly, but again, Thank you very much indeed, and if time allows, I would like to get back to you uh, in a second or so. But before we do, let's turn to President Bongo of Gabon. President uh, Bongo, you launched the Africa Adaptation Initiative in 2015 in Paris. You have been driving this agenda for many, many years. What is success in your world, sir? Federal Head of State and Government, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Mr. President of the African National Bank, Mrs. The Managing Director of the IMF, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Climate change is the greatest challenge of the 21st century. Like COVID-19, it is a global challenge that we must face together. If we have, if we are to have any hope of overcoming it. Every day, the thunderstorms seem more violent. Flooding is more frequent and droughts more severe. Around the world, forests are ablaze. Crops are failing. People are being forced to flee their homes, becoming climate refugees. Sea levels are rising potentially drowning cities and even entire countries. The oceans are turning to acid and salt is penetrating crop lands, posing further serious challenges to food security. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, Africa contributed just 3% of global emissions, but we are the continent which will pay indeed, which is already paying the biggest price. That is why the African heads of state came together in Paris to form the African Adaptation Initiative. That is why we were so enthusiastic about the creation of the Global Center for Adaptation under the leadership of Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And that, that is why I am convinced that the new program to accelerate adaptation in Africa that is being launched by the African Development Bank in coordination with the AAI and the GCA is so important. We aim to mobilize 25 billion US dollars between 1921 to, to, to 2025 for adaptation in Africa. Some estimates suggest we are soon going to need at least this much every year if we do not effectively mitigate and reverse climate change. It is because of this that we have a balanced vision to adapt the inevitable effects of climate change, but at the same time to actively contribute to fight climate change reducing and using nature-based solutions. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, if we lose the Congo Basin to deforestation, 
we will release almost 100 billion tons of carbon dioxide. Were this to happen, we have no pathway to a 1.5 degree world. Gabon, a high forest cover low deforestation country, is one of an exclusive club of countries that are carbon positive. We absorb four times more CO2 than we emit. Since, 19, uh, since 2205, when we stepped up the implementation of policies to reduce emissions from our forests, we have absorbed the equivalent of one year of emission by South Africa, UK, and France combined. We can hold our head high when it comes to fighting climate change, but we have to insist that equal att attention be paid to adaptation and mitigation in climate finance, including through climate debt swaps for developing countries. Africa calls on the developed nations to shoulder your historic responsibility and yep. to join the program to accelerate adaptation in Africa. We call on all nations together to come together and make COP15 in Kenya and COP26 in Glasgow to success the future generations so desperately need. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, President Bongo Ondimba, for these very strong words and your continued leadership on, on this topic, particularly your call to work with nature and not fight against it, particularly your reference about the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program as the framework to deliver on the Africa Adaptation Initiative. And last but not least, we need, as you said, sir, concrete outcomes, comes COP26 uh, in Glasgow on adaptation indeed. Let us turn to the next speaker, President Chisikedi, uh, Chairman of the African Union and President of DRC. President Chisikedi, you have the floor, sir. Excellence, messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, Monsieur le Secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Président de la Banque africaine de développement, distingués invités, mesdames et messieurs, je voudrais avant tout remercier les organisateurs de ces assises qui constituent une véritable opportunité pour relever les défis qui s'imposent à nous, l'urgence climatique et la pandémie à COVID-19. En effet, le monde se trouve confronté à ces deux défis majeurs qui contraignent nos efforts de développement et nous rappellent en même temps l'impératif de tirer des leçons et surtout de trouver des réponses durables pour la postérité. En ce qui concerne les défis climatiques, afin de concrétiser nos engagements pris dans le cadre de l'accord de Paris ainsi que de l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine, nous sommes invités à revisiter nos ambitions climatiques et à accélérer la mise en œuvre de nos actions prévues dans le cadre de nos priorités nationales. Pour ce faire, nos échanges devraient se focaliser sur les actions d'adaptation aux impacts de changement climatique. Il s'agit notamment des solutions fondées sur la nature, la transition énergétique, le cadre de transparence renforcé, le transfert des technologies et les financements climatiques. Pour ce qui est de la lutte contre la COVID-19, les initiatives concrètes prises par l'Union africaine ont été fructueuses. La prise de conscience rapide des dirigeants, la mise en œuvre des mécanismes concertés de lutte basés sur nos spécificités et la mise en place des cadres de lutte appropriés ont en effet permis à notre continent d'éviter les catombes qui étaient pourtant prédites et même attendues. Nous restons cependant alertes et continuons nos actions concertées pour la prévention mais aussi la recherche des solutions locales de traitement. Aussi, à la faveur de ce dialogue, de manière unanime, que le chemin parcouru, les efforts consentis ainsi que les résultats engrangés devront être maintenus et consolidés dans un élan de solidarité et de responsabilité collective. 
Il nous faut identifier les opportunités qui s'offrent à nous dans le cadre de trouver des solutions efficaces. Je formule vivement les vœux que ce dialogue auquel je souhaite un franc succès nous aide à y parvenir. Je vous remercie. Well, thank you so much, President Tusekedi, I mean, for your very strong words, and also for making COVID and climate and the nexus a central pillar of your presidency of the African Union, leading in 2021 in COP, uh, uh, at COP um, in, in Glasgow, uh, indeed. Let's go to another leader on the continent, in fact, a global leader, President Bazoum of Niger. Welcome, sir, uh, to joining on this global uh, dialogue. Uh, first of all, Congratulations with your presidency on the last few days inauguration. I mean, welcome also joining this global dialogue, perhaps even your first international dialogue on a critical uh, component. Sir, Mr. President, what is success for you? Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Excellence, uh, Monsieur le Chef d'État et du Gouvernement, distingués invités, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais remercier les organisateurs de la présente rencontre pour m'avoir associé aux discussions sur le sujet important de l'urgence climatique dans le contexte de la pandémie de la COVID-19. Le Niger a toujours placé la question climatique au centre de ses priorités, à travers notamment l'engagement résolu <coughs> et le leadership régional du président Issoufou Mahamadou, qui est le premier président de la Commission climat pour la région Sahel. Il s'y était investi en travaillant sans relâche pour une mobilisation conséquente de notre région sur la question climatique, en initiant les programmes convenus, dont, entre autres, la mise en place du cadre transitoire opérationnel de la Commission climat pour la région du Sahel, ici même à Niamey. Je suis par conséquent honoré de consacrer l'une de mes premières déclarations en qualité de président de la République du Niger aux discussions sur ce sujet de l'heure. Il est en effet urgent que les gouvernements de par le monde intensifient les initiatives, les financements et les partenariats pour accélérer l'adaptation au changement climatique. Et justement, les discussions que nous avons aujourd'hui constitue une opportunité pour bâtir un consensus stratégique fort en vue d'atteindre cet objectif. Mesdames et messieurs, j'ai noté dans le programme que nos discussions porteront essentiellement sur trois aspects de la question climatique relativement à l'ambition, au financement et au partenariat. Et j'ai aussi enregistré que pour ce faire, une contribution sur le premier aspect, à savoir celui portant sur l'ambition climatique, doit être faite. Je voudrais à ce sujet relever que la COVID-19 a malheureusement éclipsé l'urgence climatique, alors même que les préoccupations demeurent et s'exacerbent. La mobilisation en un temps record de 20 milliards de dollars pour financer les plans de relance liés à la COVID-19 illustre cet état de fait. Or, il appartient à la communauté internationale de continuer de manière soutenue les efforts visant au renforcement de la résilience, notamment en Afrique. Il faudrait en particulier que les plans de relance post-COVID-19 portent sur l'économie et l'adaptation au changement climatique. Au Sahel en particulier, les impacts néfastes des changements climatiques accélèrent la vulnérabilité des populations et les privent de leurs moyens d'existence, contribuant ainsi à l'apparition d'autres fléaux, tels que la migration des jeunes et les défis sécuritaires, comme le crime organisé et même le terrorisme. C'est dire que la combinaison de l'urgence liée à la COVID-19 et au changement climatique pourrait compromettre toute perspective économique en Afrique si des actions vigoureuses et adaptées ne sont pas prises pour sa part, le Niger a consacré d'importantes ressources pour renforcer la sécurité alimentaire et la résilience des populations au cours des dix dernières années. Nous intensifierons ces actions dans le cadre de la mise en œuvre du programme sur la base de quel j'ai été élu par les Nigériens le 21 février dernier. 
et ce d'autant plus que ce programme est en phase avec le programme d'accélération de l'adaptation en Afrique, PAAA. Le Niger attache un intérêt particulier aux actions prévues par le dit programme, surtout s'agissant du projet d'ouverture des zones de production transfrontalière intégrées et du programme de lutte contre la chenille légionnaire et autres parasites dans le domaine de la production agricole, l'appui à la mise en œuvre de la contribution déterminée au niveau national du Niger à travers des actions d'adaptation au bénéfice principalement des jeunes et des femmes. Mesdames et Messieurs, il est indispensable que les pays du Nord concrétisent enfin leur engagement pris dans le cadre de l'accord de Paris pour la mobilisation de 100 milliards de dollars par an consacrés au financement des actions climatiques au bénéfice des pays en voie de développement. La mise en œuvre des initiatives innovantes telles que le P3A et le plan d'investissement climat pour la région du Sahel, dont le programme prioritaire 2020-2021, qui bénéficie d'une annonce de contribution de l'ordre de 3,41 milliards de dollars, sont suspendus à ces engagements. Je voudrais à cet effet saluer la Banque africaine de développement pour sa décision de mobiliser 12,5 milliards de dollars sur la période 2020-2025 pour les actions d'adaptation en Afrique. Cette initiative vient s'ajouter à son autre engagement pour le financement à hauteur de 500 millions de dollars de notre programme prioritaire régional 2020-2025 annoncé lors de la table ronde de Niamey tenue le 26 février. Voilà ce que j'ai à dire. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. I mean, you're just a few days in your, in your office, but bringing this boldness to the agenda, to the dialogue, is truly unprecedented. Scale, speed, and partnerships. I know, Mr. Secretary General, you have to leave us shortly. You have heard uh, the President of Niger, you heard President Bongo of Gabon, you heard President Arashina, Kristalina, and others. What is your takeaway? Are you optimistic? Well, uh, uh, Jean Monnet used to say he was not optimistic nor pessimistic, he was determined. What I am is determined to make things happen. That is what we all need to be, because optimism in itself doesn't lead anywhere if we are not determined to make it happen. And I think that developed country leaders, the leaders of developed countries must understand one thing. Most developed countries are now committing to net zero emissions in 2050, and that is very important. But if we want to have net zero emissions in 2050, it is necessary that developing countries also make that effort, especially in emerging economies, not in Africa, but in other parts of the world. But this will not happen without a fair deal. And the fair deal means that developed countries need to massively invest in support to the developing countries, namely in adaptation. And so mitigation alone will not do it. For COP26 to be a success, for a fair deal to be possible, we need to have massive investment of the developed world in support of developing countries in adaptation, and we need finance to reveal true solidarity within our international community. Without that strong financial commitment to support the developing world in adaptation and also in their mitigation efforts, we will not have the results we need in COP26 in Glasgow. Well, thank you so much, Secretary General Guterres, with your three messages. Determination, determination, and determination, particularly on investing in adaptation, while also not forgetting to reduce our carbon footprint across the world. I thank you very much, also on behalf of President Adeshina, and former Secretary Ban Ki-moon, and President uh, Bongo of Gabon. Thank you very much indeed. Let's turn to our next speaker, talking about leadership on the continent and beyond, President Saul of Senegal. President Macky Sall was also a member of the high-level panel on water, is a strong advocate for action on the ground. Let's hear from him. President Saul, you have the floor, sir. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, Permettez-moi de remercier les organisateurs de cet important dialogue, uh, dialogue au sommet sur l'urgence climatique et la COVID-19 en Afrique. Et je voudrais particulièrement remercier le secteur général Antonio Guterres 
le président des Nations Unies, ainsi que le président du groupe de la Banque, mondiale, euh, la Banque africaine de développement, qui a dessiné à Tourini, euh, la directrice générale du Fonds monétaire, que je félicite pour le dynamisme du Fonds dans ce contexte de pandémie, mais également M. Ban Ki-moon, ancien secrétaire général des Nations Unies, tout comme le président du Centre mondial pour l'adaptation. Et je salue tous les collègues chefs d'État et chefs de gouvernement qui prennent part à cette discussion. L'urgence climatique. Il me semble essentiel de souligner l'ampleur du défi climatique en Afrique. Aujourd'hui, le continent est traversé par une alternance de sécheresse et d'inondations qui se suivent. Une perturbation des cycles agricoles, une avancée du désert, une avancée de la mer, un approvisionnement un appauvrissement de, de la biodiversité, mais également une avancée de la déforestation. Autant de facteurs négatifs sur l'équilibre de la biodiversité. Et il est essentiel de rappeler aussi que l'Afrique subit le changement climatique, beaucoup plus qu'elle ne le provoque. Nous savons que l'Afrique contribue pour moins de 4% sur les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Mais elle, elle, elle subit de façon directe euh, les conséquences de, cette, de ces changements climatiques. Pour cela, nous avons tous parlé de l'accélération sur les programmes d'adaptation en Afrique. Et je salue tous les plaidoyers qui ont été faits avant moi pour insister auprès des pays développés pays principalement pollueurs qui doivent respecter les engagements sur le financement de l'adaptation en Afrique. Évidemment, sans ce financement, nous n'irons pas loin et nous tournerons en rond à chaque conférence pour revenir sur les mêmes engagements qui ont, qui ont été dits. La conférence de Paris est là pour nous le rappeler. Mais l'Afrique essaie déjà d'apporter sa contribution, sa réponse, et je voudrais insister sur la réponse du Sénégal face à l'urgence climatique. C'est d'abord une réponse sur un reboisement assez intensif dans le cadre de la Grande Muraille Verte que nous partageons avec dix autres pays du Sahara et du Sahel. C'est aujourd'hui qui est une initiative que je salue parce qu'elle est euh, totalement adossée à l'Union africaine et aux Nations unies. Il y a également un vaste programme de développement des énergies propres, centrales solaires, ou de l'éolienne, avec les parcs d'éoliens qui ont été mis en œuvre, euh, mais surtout l'hydroélectricité et le gaz aujourd'hui qui nous permet de faire la transition énergétique, ce qui fait qu'au moment où je vous parle, nous sommes à plus de 30% d'énergie propre dans notre parc aujourd'hui de production. Nous devons poursuivre ces efforts, mais l'Afrique a besoin véritablement que les engagements soient respectés pour que l'adaptation, tout ce financement qui a été donc, euh, engagé puisse voir euh, une réalisation. Je voudrais très rapidement passer sur la COVID en Afrique pour souligner l'effet dévastateur de la pandémie, au-delà des décès, mais qui est un effet, une pandémie qui freine la trajectoire d'émergence de l'Afrique. Depuis 25 ans, le continent a connu une trajectoire positive de croissance, avec une très forte accélération pour la décennie écoulée. Voilà que malheureusement, depuis 2020, on a assisté à une chute brutale, voire une récession dans la plupart des pays. C'est dire que cette récession va avoir des impacts extrêmement négatifs sur notre économie et sur le social. Et va entraîner des crises profondes dans les pays. Euh, il est important que nous soyons conscients des conséquences de la pandémie sur la stabilité du continent, puisque nous ferons face à d'énormes revendications tout à fait légitimes, d'ailleurs, des populations, face aux cartes d'emploi, face également aux entreprises qui vont fermer et devant les difficultés de mobiliser les ressources. Alors, sur cela, je salue l'initiative du G20 sur la dette. Euh, ça a été une initiative importante qui doit être prolongée sur l'année 2021. Mais il faut tout de suite souligner les limites de cette initiative. 
que les sanitaires, mais qui ne permet pas d'assurer les conditions d'une relance économique sur le continent. Nous devons donc, après avoir salué l'émission de DTS avec le Fonds monétaire, qui nous permet d'ailleurs tout de suite de rentrer en possession de, nos, de notre code part, mais nous savons que cette code part n'est pas suffisante là aussi. J'insiste sur le plaidoyer pour une réallocation des pays riches vers l'Afrique afin de permettre de financer la croissance qui devra permettre de donner des emplois et donc d'assurer la stabilité du continent. Et pour terminer, on ne peut pas parler de Covid sans aborder la question du vaccin, de l'accès au vaccin. Après avoir salué les différentes initiatives COVAX, AVAX pour l'Union africaine, nous devons veiller à ce que ces initiatives, après un premier jet, puissent permettre aux pays de disposer du vaccin, puisque sans le vaccin, il est clair que la pandémie va se poursuivre et les conséquences pour lesquelles nous parlons vont donc s'amplifier. Voilà ce que je voulais dire encore une fois, un plaidoyer pour l'accès universel au vaccin. Et l'Afrique aussi doit produire des vaccins. Euh, le Sénégal sera disponible avec l'Institut Pasteur de Dakar. Déjà produit la, le vaccin contre la fièvre jaune pour pouvoir produire également un vaccin anti-Covid. Voilà ce que je voulais dire très rapidement en vous remerciant encore une fois pour cette importante rencontre. Well, thank you so much, President uh, Macky Sall, for your continued leadership, uh, not only at home, but on the continent, and in fact, on the global stage. Your message is clear. You're driving leadership. You're driving action at home. Development gains are lost because of COVID, and the green recovery is the way to go. But the developed nations need to put their money where their mouth is and need to generate and mobilize additional resources. Thank you again, sir, for your very strong words of encouragement. Thank you for your leadership. Let's turn to another leader on the continent, President Akufo Addo, President of Ghana. Mr. President, you were with us at the Climate Adaptation Summit last January. Let's see whether we can uh, tune in to Mr. President Akufo Addo in Accra. If not, I would like to turn quickly to President Adashina. President Adashina, you've heard uh, the initial uh, statements of colleagues of leaders on the continent. Please, a quick response before I see that uh, President Ak uh, Akufo Addo is with us. A short remark, so Mr. President Adashina. Well, I thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Uh, you know, the, the words that I keep hearing is solidarity, uh, is determination, is that we need more resources, and that, you know, there's just no way that uh, Africa can uh, go through this alone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fantastic to hear all the words about the link of using the African Adaptation, um, African Acceler Adaptation Acceleration Program to, to, to really bring life and scale and success and impact to the African Adaptation Initiative, as His Excellency President Bongo has actually mentioned. You know, the issues coming up in terms of the need to also look at energy. As the UN Secretary General said, that energy is very, very important. If you don't have access to a clean energy, in particular for cooking, all the great green wall that we're talking about uh, will simply become nothing but uh, maybe just uh, a pile of charcoal uh, of fuel will just waiting to be, to be cut down. We hear a lot about the need for and nature-based solutions, and in particular for, uh, uh, for, for communities. So what I'm really hearing is that the time for action is now, I think, is determination to turn uh, basically ambition into reality. And that's coming across very, very clear. So President Arashina, big brother, I mean, for your words, time for action is now. Well, the man of action is President Akufo Addo, President of Ghana. Mr. President, you were with us during the Climate Adaptation Summit. You're at the forefront of driving this agenda globally. What is next? Mr. President. So, Excellencies, um, I thank the Africa Development Bank and the Global Center on Adaptation for organizing this important dialogue. It's coming at a very crucial time in our fight against the deadly coronavirus pandemic. 
Our world has been seized by the ongoing pandemic for the past year, but fortunately for us all, this year has brought some hope with the development of vaccines and their distribution across the globe. With great determination, we must scale up our efforts until the pandemic is defeated. And in so doing, we must ensure that the vaccine will reach the farthest corners of the earth, of the world. For once the virus still lingers, even in the remotest part of the world, the whole world remains at risk. And all our efforts will be in vain unless we ensure equitable distribution of the vaccine across the globe. Whilst we deal with the current global emergency, we must not lose sight of another debilitating crisis that is silently plaguing our planet, and that is climate change. There are indeed real parallels between climate change and the ongoing pandemic. Like the virus, climate change is ravaging lives, decimating livelihoods, and threatening the faith of the entire planet. Like the virus, climate change is proven to be a threat multiplier, exacerbating existing problems and creating new ones. And like the virus, the effects of climate change are not limited to national boundaries and, and forcing irreversible changes in our lives and lifestyles globally. We cannot wait until the silent crisis reaches pandemic levels before we act. We have to act now and do so with gusto. For failure to act now will be catastrophic in terms of the lives and livelihoods of billions of the world's people who are at risk. Indeed, our ongoing battle against the coronavirus should not be delinked from the urgency of tackling climate change. We must see the climate change crisis as a deadly and merciless enemy in the same way that we see the coronavirus. And as we do so, we must use and see an opportunity in the midst of this pandemic to focus even more strongly on environmental equity and environmental protection to build back better and to build back greener. Addressing the climate crisis will put our world on a solid foundation and a firm base and path to deal with future pandemics. We have a lifetime opportunity in this period to build back better. We cannot afford to lose this opportunity. Climate change concerns must be at the heart of national and international recovery plans and efforts. Our world has the wherewithal to rise to the occasion and deal with the climate crisis, just as we're dealing with the pandemic. We have the knowledge, capacity, and innovation. And we should be anxious, ambitious enough to master the full complement of resources needed to fight this common enemy. We have to act now and do so with a sense of urgency to help mitigate against future pa pandemics. And in so saying, I'd like to associate myself strongly with the concluding comments of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, President Akufo Addo, for your very strong words, for your leadership, but also for your strong reminder that we have to treat the climate crisis as it is, as a true um, emergency. We have to rise to the occasion. We know what to do. Let's do it. Let's move to another part of Africa. We're going to Egypt, President al-Sisi. Egypt is leading the Adaptation Action Coalition together with the United Kingdom. Sir, we're honored having you with us in this global conversation, and we're looking forward for your strong words of action indeed. Mr. President. Sie <laughs> 
في بعض لونها ومن لونها نصف على نحو بات يهدد مستقبل شعوبنا ويؤثر على امنها وسلامتها لا سيما في ظل اصرار بعض الاطراف على اقامه مشروعات عملاقه لاستغلال الظهار الدوليه بشكل غير مدروس ودون مراعاه لاهميه الحفاظ على سلامه واستدامه الموارد المائيه الدوليه ودون تقدير للتحدي العالمي المشترك الذي يمثله تغير المناخ وتداعياته تؤكد مصر دعمها لانذاء سكرتير عام الامم المتحده بضروره توجيه الدول المتقدمه لخمسين في الميه من تمويل المناخ الذي تقدمه الى الدول الناميه لصالح التكيف وبناء القدره على تحمل الاثار السلبيه لتغير المناخ كما اؤكد التزام مصر القوي والممتد ازاء جهود التكيف مع تغير المناخ فداخليا نعكف حاليا على بلوره استراتيجيه وطنيه متكامله حول تغير المناخ يمثل التكيف فيها محورا رئيسيا واقليميا اطلقت مصر المبادره الافريقيه للتكيف في عام 2015 وجاري تفعيلها وبحث استضافه مقرها في مصر اما دوليا فترأس مع المملكه المتحده تحالفا طموحا للتكيف تعود زوره الى قمه السكرتير عام الامم المتحده للمناخ لعام 2019 كما ندعم الجهود الدوليه الراميه لتحديث ورفع طموحات المساهمات المحدده وطنيا تحت انفاق تحت اتفاق باريس خاصه من الدول المتقدمه وفي الختام اود الاشاره الى تقدم مصر وعرض رسمي لاستضافه الدوره ال27 لمؤتمر اطراف اتفاقيه الامم المتحده الاطاريه لتغير المناخ والتي نسعى لجعلها علامه فارقه على طريق دفع موضوعات التكيف وتصدر الاجنده الدوليه لتغير لتغير المناخ ونتطلع الى دعم اشقائنا في القاره الافريقيه في هذا الصدد ونتعهد بالعمل الدؤوب والمخلص لتصب نتائجها في مصلحه القاره وكافه ابنائها كما نتطلع الى العمل المشترك مع الرئاسه البريطانيه القادمه لمؤتمر الاطراف وصولا الى خروج الدوره ال 26 من المؤتمر بنتائج فعاله تصب في تعزيز جهود التكيف على كافه المستويات وشكرا لحسن الاستماع. Well, thank you so much, uh, President Al Sisi, for your strong words, for your leadership, for your commitment to make this a very important agenda indeed going forward. You mentioned, uh, Mr. President, the importance of financing. About 100 billion needs to be delivered. I mean, President Adeshina called it promises made and promises kept. That's what it all comes down to at the end of the day indeed. Let's turn to our next speaker, the Finance Minister, the Treasury Secretary of the United States, Secretary Yellen, who speaks on behalf of President Joe Biden. Hello, everyone. My name is Janet Yellen. I'm the Treasury Secretary of the United States. And on behalf of President Biden, thank you for the chance to say a word about climate change and the threat it poses to our world community. We know climate change will, and indeed already is, affecting us all. But we also know that in few places is the impact greater or more unfair than in Africa. The continent has contributed only marginally to the world's carbon emissions, and yet its people stand to suffer the most because of them. I believe we can still avoid the worst effects of climate change and limit Earth's temperature increase to one and a half degrees. That's why the United States has rejoined the Paris Agreement. The United States remains a committed development partner for Africa. Climate change, of course, presents a set of technical challenges for developing economies. One is the tension between growth and mitigation. 
How can African nations be leaders in limiting emissions while still generating economic growth? I know many leaders here have been at the forefront of that conversation. But even as we work to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, we also must help people cope with the impacts of a climate that is already changing. Thinking more innovatively about adaptation and adaptation finance are key to this. We'll need new ways of mobilizing capital for public projects like sea barriers and irrigation systems. And we need to ensure that the private sector is pricing in the risk of climate change to their investments too. I want to congratulate the Global Center and the African Development Bank for being leaders in this work and developing this Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. Please know the United States is a strong financial supporter of the African Development Bank, and we intend to build on our partnership with you and the broader community of multilateral institutions. Together, we believe we can avoid the worst effects of climate change while helping billions of people adapt to our changing world. Wow, what a strong message coming from Washington uh, on behalf of President Joe Biden uh, expressed by Secretary Yellen. I mean, it's very clear adaptation is finance is key. The private sector needs to do its part. But also, the United States are not only back in the Paris Agreement, they are back as a solid partner for Africa. Two weeks from now, President Joe Biden is hosting a leader's summit. So let us see how strong and committed that meeting will be on Africa and on adaptation itself indeed. Talking about leadership, talking about a journey, a leader who has been with us from the beginning is Minister Olstein from Norway. Development Minister in Norway, sir, you have been with us at the Adaptation Summit. You're part of the board of the Global Center on Adaptation. You're a strong supporter of the African Development Bank. You're really in touch with the Africa Adaptation Initiative. Minister Olstein, what is next for you? In fact, what is next for Africa? Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. And first, let me thank the African Development Bank and the Global Center on Adaptation for its tremendous work and for organizing this crucial dialogue. I think such leadership is exactly what our climate and our common future need now. And I'm so inspired from the engagement and all the strong statements already heard in this dialogue, and not least from the UN Secretary Generals, both the current and, and former. As, as you all know, there is no way we can eradicate extreme poverty by 2030, nor reach the other sustainable development goals, nor combat COVID-19 without successfully fighting climate change. And the Paris Agreement is the map we share on this path. And we have no time to waste in cutting emissions, but equally important and urgent that we hear the full the full instruction from Paris. Because as we aim to eradicate extreme poverty by the end of this decisive decade, we may risk losing 10 years of progress instead because of climate change, COVID-19 and conflict, and because of the way these three C's interact and lead to more hunger. A key response from all of us should therefore be to mobilize a much larger share of climate finance than today for adaptation and resilience building. And that is exactly what the AAAP is all about. So how can we together minimize the risk of climate disasters and make food systems more resilient, making the most vulnerable better placed to cope with the next drought, flood or plague and create much needed jobs at the same time? Again, this is exactly what the AAAP is all about. What we really know is that risk cannot be managed in silos. Adaptation and risk reduction must be integrated in overall national and local plans and across sectors. And listen, the young voice, their skills, the youth cannot be approached only as a target group. They are not the leaders of tomorrow. They are the most important voice today. And this is such a key if we should manage to build the needed trust between generations and between people across borders 
and reach our common targets together. So we therefore need to make sure that those who are hit the hardest are included, not only as beneficiaries, but as participants and experts of their own situation. In moving forward, the three key words are scale, leverage, and partnerships. First, scale, let us provide leadership, enhance ambitions, and increase our support to adaptation. And inspired by Secretary General determination, Norway has made adaptation, resilience, and food security with a focus on Africa a key priority, just like Paris has told us to do. Right now, 700 million people in this world do not know where the next meal will come from. So investing in ending hunger today is also investing in the prevention of hunger tomorrow. Second, leverage. We must use our resources efficiently, crowding in investment from other sources, in particular from the private sector, bringing on board the macroeconomic perspective in this. And third, partnership. By working together, we can build resilient societies, help those who suffer from hunger because of the virus and those who suffer before the pandemic. And again, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program has a formidable potential to become exactly the kind of partnership needed. In the face of the triple crisis of conflict, COVID-19 and climate change, let us meet this web of crisis with a web of solutions that are equally interweaved. The effects of global warming generally hit the poorest countries and the most vulnerable groups in the, uh, the hardest, those who have done the least to create the challenges. So contributing to risk reduction, more climate resilient agriculture and more climate resilient food system is so central in our work moving forward. So let us approach climate adaptation with technological innovation and political obstacles with political innovation. Let us keep our eyes stubbornly on our goals. And again, for the fourth or fifth time, I really think the Africa Adaptation Acceler Acceleration Program has such a huge potential to become exactly the kind of partnership and vehicle needed. So thank you, Patrick, and over to you again. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister Olstein, for your very strong words. Also for your recognition that we have to transform the triple crisis into the triple dividend for health, for economy, and for the climate. And also, we count on you continuously as becoming a friend of Africa, delivering also in support of the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program indeed. Let's turn to an icon of Africa for a true global leader, President Kenyatta, President of Kenya. Mr. President, I'm extremely humbled having you with us in this dialogue. You were with us during the Climate Adaptation Summit last January, in which you highlighted the importance of partnerships. Sir, what is your view? What is your measurement of success once we move forward? Thank you very much once again for this opportunity. And uh, let me greet you all morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you're all listening into and say how delighted I am once again to join all of you, my colleagues from across the globe, who have agreed to come together. And as we have always said, we have emphasized the need for climate action that underpins sustainable development, indeed in the post-COVID-19 period, and also our green recovery plans to build back better. And I believe we do this in recognition of the fact that Africa is one of the most vulnerable continents to climate change and climate vulnerability, a situation that unfortunately has been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Multiple systemic shocks are now simultaneously threatening African communities and a health crisis, an economic crisis, a food security crisis, have all been compounded by this subject that we are continuously debating, that of the climate change crisis. The impact, therefore, of the COVID-19 pandemic on Africa's social economic development has been devastating. For the first time in 25 years, the African continent is experiencing a decrease in our gross domestic product, a decrease estimated by more than 3% in 2020. 
And this has rendered many, many millions of our people into extreme poverty. Improved access to finance at scale is therefore key if African economies are to be able to restart their economies. And indeed, once again, embark on a low carbon, resilient and inclusive recovery of which we are partners too, but not the cause of. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in Kenya, we are well aware that climate change poses an existential threat to our survival. Indeed, Kenya is ranked 31st most vulnerable country in the world. And research shows that climate change, as I said before, leads to about a 3% loss in GDP annually. Extreme interannual temperature and precipitation fluctuations accounts for about 50% of the variability in maize yields and undermines water availability and negatively also impacts public health and exasperates our food insecurity. We in Kenya, therefore, have deployed significant national resources to scale up adaptation efforts, and Kenya's updated national determined contribution provides a comprehensive overview of adaptation priorities with an estimated implementation cost of approximately 4.4 billion US dollars every year. And while we can realistically mobilize domestic resources to meet about 13% of this cost, we would need our external partners to support us with the remaining 87%. And this is a scenario that does not apply just to Kenya. And this, I believe, we can also do by dealing realistically with our debt in order to increase fiscal space for our economies to build back greener and to build back better. Ladies and gentlemen, as I have just said, the situation that we are dealing with is not unique to Kenya. Indeed, as indicated in the re recent UNEP adaptation gap report, current adaptation costs, estimates for developing countries are about US dollars 70 billion per year, and this is expected to rise to approximately 140 billion to 300 billion by the year 2030, if no adaptation measures are made today. I want to, at this stage, acknowledge with deep appreciation the initiative by the African Development Bank and the Global Adaptation Center to implement a new, much bolder African Adaptation Acceleration Program that we have heard of previously. This program, ladies and gentlemen, I believe will go a long way to support countries like Kenya to scale up climate adaptation and resilience and to provide significant resources for climate adaptation throughout Africa and indeed throughout the Caribbean, the Pacific, and most of the global south. So today, we gather to call upon all global leaders to demand an ambitious climate action, intensify resource mobilization efforts, and increase technical support to developing countries, especially those in the south, in technology, as well as capacity building. Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate, and I want to underscore, on the need to also leverage private sector as well as international finance if we are to achieve this ambitious climate adaptation agenda. It is only through partnerships like this that we can strengthen and accelerate resilience across our continent. The current level of ambition, ladies and gentlemen, we must agree is too low to meet the Paris Agreement of 1.5 degrees centigrade. The 2020 Interim United Nations Framework Convention on the Climate Change Synthesis Report submitted nationally determined contributions. This indicates that we can only close the emissions gap 
and build the resilience of our communities if the major emitters raise their ambition. And all countries submit their updated nationally determined contributions before COP26 later this year. So ladies and gentlemen, to achieve the long-term objectives of the Paris Agreement, we must all develop our long-term greenhouse gas strategies that articulate clearly our vision and how we are going to manage climate change impacts. Mr. And I am happy to announce today that my administration is in the process of developing a long-term greenhouse gas emission strategy for 2050, and we aim to submit our strategy to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change before COP26 in Glasgow later this year. As I associate myself with the remarks of those who have spoken before me, let me also take this opportunity to conclude my remarks with the same rallying call to all global leaders to achieve economic prosperity today and to secure it for our future generations we must all simultaneously take bold actions now to bend not only the COVID-19 pandemic curve, but as well as the climate change curve. I want to thank you all for your attention and look forward to partnering with you to achieve this noble agenda. Thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, President uh, Kenyatta, for your very bold statement, but also for your very strong leadership at home. You have submitted your national determined contribution. You have made clear what you can do. Now others need to play their part to partner with you. We extend your invitation on your behalf. Very strong words. I want to quickly go to President Adeshina to respond to what you've heard so far. Mr. Adeshina, any quick reflections? Oh, absolutely. I, am, uh, I continue to be enormously encouraged and humbled by the tremendous amount of support uh, okay. of the Chinese yeah, 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 uh, uh, speaking to us. Um, first and foremost is that we hear very clearly that uh, the African Acceleration, Adaptation Acceleration Program is a formidable uh, partnership, and it is a formidable partnership in terms of public, in terms of private, in terms of governments, and in terms of taking things to scale, I think in realizing Africa's ambition. Uh, it was so heartwarming to hear uh, the message from uh, Secretary Yellen uh, of, the, of the United States, uh, you know, President Biden's uh, uh, um, words of great support uh, to Africa, and of course, support for the African Adapt Adaptation Acceleration Program, but also for the African Development Bank, for which I'm enormously grateful uh, for Madam Secretary Yellen for, uh, for those words. But we also heard about the importance of scale, importance of leverage, the importance of partnership. I've just had uh, for, for President Kenyatta there. And we also heard from the various presidents and interventions that have been made about the importance of private sector. I think we continue to have to look at that, how to mobilize green investments for private sector. But we also had very much from Minister uh, Olsen right there, the importance and also President Kayata about the importance of food security. We, you know, medicines don't work uh, uh, um, if, I mean, uh, if you don't have food and vaccines don't work uh, if, you're not, if you don't have food. So the importance of keeping our eye on food security and the importance of technology solutions to do that. And also about inclusivity. We need to make sure recovery is inclusive. And we also have to manage water because the link of water and conflict, and of course, the importance of solving the problem of debt. So if I may just summarize what I've heard, you know, uh, Patrick, is that we must raise ambition, 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 uh, that we must keep our eyes uh, uh, stubbornly on our goals that we want to achieve. And we must make sure that that is driven by action, 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 paying attention to equity and equity and equity, but all that cannot be achieved unless there, there are resources, resources and resources. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for your strong words and also encouragement of we need partnerships, we need African leaders, and at the same time, we need our development partners coming in strongly committed with the resources, with the resolve to, to drive this agenda together. Well, in fact, a leader uh, from Europe is Denmark. Denmark is for many years a close friend of Africa. We have with us Minister Muller Mortensen, Development Minister of, of Denmark, recently appointed, already made his mark in his first few months in office. 
Minister Muller Mertens, you have heard your colleagues, African leaders, you've heard Akin Adesina. What's in it for Denmark? Thank you. Excellences, ministers, distinguished colleagues, climate change adaptation is not a choice. It's a necessity for addressing the current climate crisis and promoting sustainable development. I'm so happy to participate in this important dialogue focused on Africa. The African continent is particularly exposed to the impact of climate change and already faces more frequent extreme weather events. Climate change is disrupting the continent's agriculture and water supply. It's threatening coastal zones and cities. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic is eroding recent progress in building resilience, leaving countries and communities more vulnerable. This is why we need to step up efforts for climate adaptation and resilience in Africa. Denmark is strongly committed to do our part, for sure. Driving adaptation and resilience is a key pillar in Denmark's new global strategy for climate action. As an example, we are doubling our efforts to ensure that by 2023, Denmark has ensured access to clean water to close to 6 million people in Africa. Access to water is a prime example of the close link between adaptation and overcoming the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to build back better and greener. Increasing financing for climate adaptation is key. Only around 20% of the total global climate financing is allocated to adaptation. The share of mobilized private financing is only around 5%. This needs to change. In our global climate strategy, we have set a clear direction already for an enhanced adaptation investment, primarily in Africa. Going forward, we will set bold targets that match the scope of the challenge. I salute the strong engagement of the African Development Bank. We will continue to encourage other MDBs to rise financing to adaptation. And finally, I'm glad to announce that I have accepted the invitation to join the GCA's advisory board. I'm excited to contribute to driving forward this important agenda. Let's go to work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister Miller Mortensen. Also on your last statement, joining the board of the Global Center on Adaptation, obviously we're very humbled. And I can assure you, sir, tomorrow morning we will reach out to you. I'm sure also speak on behalf of President Adeshina because we have an irresistible offer, which is the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. You mentioned the need for increased finance. We have the vehicle. Thank you so much again, uh, sir, for joining us during this very important dialogue. Congratulations with your leadership, and we look forward to working with you in the years to come indeed. Let's turn to our next speaker, who is from the World of Health, the World Health Organization. Let's go to Director General Dr. Tedros indeed. Your Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Aid Secretary General of the United Nations and Chair of the Global Center on Adaptation, Dr. Adesina, President of the African Development Bank, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. It's an honor to address this leader's dialogue on the Africa COVID climate emergency. The new Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program is exactly the sort of bold collaboration required to address the complex structural issues underlying both the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis. The health sector is one of the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and a key priority sector for adaptation. Despite this, only 0.5% of multilateral climate finance is currently spent on health protection. Financing the overall health response to the pandemic and the climate crisis is essential to save lives and drive a social 
and economic recovery. I commend your visionary efforts. We must work together to build the greener, healthier, and fairer world we all want. I thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Director General uh, Dr. Tedros. Uh, also reminding us that later this year, the African Development Bank, uh, the WHO, the Global Center on Adaptation, and other partners, we are launching the State and Trends in Adaptation in Africa just before COP26. Let's turn to another extraordinary leader on the continent, Prime Minister Hamdok, Prime Minister of Sudan, a country which has just finalized its national adaptation plan. Sir, how can we support you in this journey? Thank you so much, Excellencies, Head of State and Government, Excellencies, Chair and CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation, President Adesina, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to the Global Center on Adaptation for the invitation to participate in this leaders' dialogue on the Africa COVID climate emergency. Also thanks to the African Development Bank for its support to Sudan and looking forward to the return of the country as a full member of the bank after the clearance of its arrears. Sudan understands and appreciates the importance of adaptation and its crucial role for African countries and economies and communities and support the initiatives undertaken by the bank. As you know, Africa and Sudan are subjected to high vulnerability to climate change adversities, particularly agriculture, which is projected to face serious threats of increased heat and water stresses. Furthermore, COVID-19 pandemic weakened adaptive capacity and resilience in Africa with a weak preparedness to absorb and mitigate exogenous shocks. It has significant negative impacts on health, food security, loss of income, and livelihood, especially those engaged in the informal economic activities. In this context, major challenges include the integration of the informal activities in the organized modern spheres of the economy and expansion of employment opportunities in agro-industrialization and rural value chains. Therefore, digital transformation is inevitable for post-COVID-19 recovery. I would like in my concluding remark to highlight <clears throat> the wheat production story in Sudan as an example of successful adaptation and resilience. With the support of the African Development Bank to the agricultural research for development of strategic crops, particularly wheat project, and more recently, technologies for African agricultural transformation, these projects have become a game changer in my country. Through this intervention, it was possible to adopt many high yielding and heat tolerant varieties for heat stressed ecologies of Sudan, which enabled us to achieve 50% of wheat self-sufficiency. But most importantly, it has made it possible to produce wheat in climates previously considered totally impossible to produce wheat there. So thank you very much for the bank, and let's join hands in partnerships in working together in addressing the calamities and the challenges of the pandemic, but also the issue of the adaptation to the changing climate. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Prime Minister Hamdok, for your strong uh, words of commitment, but also for the reminder of putting food security at the heart of the green recovery. And I think it's very important, as you said, uh, uh, sir, that as part of the adaptation uh, action agenda, which President Arashina and, and we are launching today, food security is one of the four quick pillars. Let's quickly go to, uh, to President Arashina. I just want you to respond to this, what you just heard, uh, sir. Any quick reflections? 
Well, absolutely. You know, uh, you know the, the the thing. Let me start from the the point of, on health from Pedro uh, uh, Tedros is that we, we the health matters. Uh, if you have healthy populations, uh, well-fed populations, you have higher productivity. So, in expanding our investment also in health, it's very critical for us to be able to adapt to the climate change, but also to adapt as well to the issue of the COVID-19. The issue of water, I think, continues to come up in terms of how we manage water. I think that continues to be an issue. Um, we had about the importance of not forgetting the bottom of the pyramid, in particular the informal sector, how in the recovery process we have to make sure it's actually quite inclusive and creates job and creates a lot more opportunities for those uh, that, are, that are in that uh, informal, uh, informal sector. We heard about the importance of digital uh, transformation, you know, uh, and we talked about that uh, in, uh, in, in, our, in, in our conversation, uh, whether it's in agriculture, uh, whether it's in health, uh, you know, the importance of digital technology and of course for digital finance is critical. And just on what Prime Minister Hamdok said, I wanted to, 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 to amplify the power of the statement that he said. You know, when we have platforms that deliver technologies at scale for drought tolerant wheat that he mentioned in the case of Sudan, you know, I was talking with him just a few days ago and he told me that, that those technologies that are heat tolerant wheat lines are being grown on over 800,000 acres in the Gerzira scheme. And as you just heard from him, he said, you know, these are areas that have never grown uh, wheat, but because the right technologies are there. So just to continue to realize that we must continue to drive food security. In fact, I think that the risks are probably much higher for many in, uh, in Africa, uh, perhaps to die from hunger than even to die from COVID pandemic. And so we have to make sure that we boost people's access to food, good nutrition, because vaccines are important, but only nutrition can sustain. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for reminding us uh, of the importance of food security indeed. Let's turn to our next speaker, a truly unprecedented leader on the continent, the president of Botswana, President Masisi. Sir, what is success for you? What do you need out of this conversation? And how can we support you going forward? I think, sir, there is a slight, uh, uh, I cannot hear you. Let's see whether there's a sound issue. This is adaptation in action. No, I, I think I need to unmute. Oh, here Can you go. You know, we're in the world of Zoom so and uh, exactly. So <laughs> welcome again, uh, Mr. President. The floor is yours. We're very keen to hear your, your vision and your boldness going forward. Thank you so much. Allow me to express my sincere appreciation for the invitation to participate in this important event. Let me further thank the organizers, the African Development Bank, and the Global Center for Adaptation for bringing us together as African leaders to discuss the twin crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. Today's conversation comes at a time when many of us have diverted scanty national resources to fight COVID-19, therefore making it very difficult to tackle other global challenges such as climate change. The need for climate financing is therefore more crucial than ever before. Mr. President, my country is one of those heavily affected by climate change. Botswana is an arid country with low and erratic rainfall, high temperatures and very limited water, surface water, an increased frequency of extreme weather conditions such as droughts and floods compound these problems. These harsh weather conditions increase household vulnerability, especially those who are dependent on rain-fed arable agriculture for food production. To address these challenges, we are modernizing our agricultural sector by making use of digital technologies and climate smart agriculture. This is also an area where our entrepreneurial tech savvy youth can make contributions by developing innovative solutions. Botswana is well placed to pursue solar energy given a high level of solar irradiation. Projects of the so in the solar space require financial investment to strengthen regional power distribution infrastructure to facilitate power exports and imports. Botswana considers the Zambezi Integrated Agro-Commercial Development Project important for agricultural modernization, food and water security, I therefore wish to express my profound gratitude to the African Development Bank for providing transactionary 
advisory service to this important project. These efforts, which aim to build our climate resilience and adaptation, certainly require substantial financing. To this end, I note with appreciation that the 2021 Climate Adaptation Summit has committed to mobilize finances to enhance climate adaptation and resilience across our continent. I believe that the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, AAAP, will help to mobilize the finances for my country and the continent at large to pursue programs geared towards investing in renewable energy, improving food security, upscaling investment in renewable energy, and developing robust water supply infrastructure across Africa. Finally, I want to underscore that upscaling the 100 billion US dollar climate finance commitment made in 2009 to help our countries to tackle climate change is even more crucial in light of our diminishing finances. I hope the, that the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, will be held later this year, will map an implementation plan that actualizes this financing mechanism. I want to thank you most sincerely for the opportunity to participate and for your attention. Well, thank you so much, President Masisi, for your very strong leadership on this particular topic. I mean, speaking to the COVID adaptation and nexus indeed, realizing that COVID has further uh, constrained uh, fiscal capacity. With other words, there is a need for international finance to come in. You call for an implementation plan. Well, you have it, sir, through the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. What we now need is sufficient, substantive financing to deliver indeed on the needs which you just expressed. We count on your leadership and we look forward to working with you and supporting you moving forward in the next few months indeed. Let's go to our next speaker, the president from Mozambique, President Nusi. Sir, can we just hear your views? What needs to happen? You've exposed to cyclones in the last uh, few years. You know what it is living on the front lines, but we also know what leadership is because you're demonstrating it on a daily basis. Sir. Obrigado, excelências, caros participantes, colegas. Começo por felicitar aos organizadores deste diálogo virtual de alto nível sobre as emergências de Covid-19 e mudanças climáticas em África, com vista a acelerar a nossa resiliência e adaptação a estes desafios de atualidade no quadro do Programa de Aceleração e Adaptação em África. Estamos num paradoxo em que, por um lado, assiste a redução de financiamentos nacionais e internacionais para os programas favoráveis à resiliência e adaptação às mudanças climáticas, com outras determinantes sociais e econômicas a agravar, ainda mais a situação revertendo os anteriores ganhos no financiamento ao desenvolvimento. A África em geral e Moçambique em particular estão entre os mais vulneráveis aos desastres naturais. Os eventos climáticos extremos, que ontem eram raros, atualmente são cada vez frequentes e intensos. Sofremos seca prolongada, calor intenso, cheias e inundações, ciclones e outros fatores associados como a subida do nível das águas do mar, intrusão ou salida e queimadas resultando em prejuízos entre perdas de milhares de vidas humanas, infraestruturas públicas e privadas, comunidades sanitárias, escolas, estradas, pontes, redes de transporte de energia e residências. Os ciclones Idai, ainda bem que mencionou, e Kenneth, que afetaram a região em 2019, são exemplo claro destes eventos extremos. Os dois ciclones só em Moçambique causaram 689 mortes e impactos negativos equivalentes a mais de 3 bilhões de dólares americanos. Na época corrente, fomos novamente atingidos por três ciclones tropicais, o Xalane, Elois e Guambe. A Covid-19 veio agravar ainda mais impacto negativo no desempenho da nossa economia. A título de exemplo, 
o turismo que já era vulnerável aos desastres naturais, que destroem naturais, que destroem instâncias e diminuem as entradas de turistas, é o setor mais atingido, concorrendo para a redução do produto interno bruto e atraso no alcance dos objetivos de desenvolvimento sustentável. Sem incluir os impactos do IDAI, em média, só no setor de infraestruturas, Moçambique, nos últimos 20 anos, vem sofrendo danos de cerca de 100 milhões de dólares americanos por ano. No cenário de exiguidade de recursos agravada pela Covid-19, tivemos de concentrar investimentos na saúde e alívio econômico e muito pouco na resiliência e adaptação climática. O nosso orçamento sofreu mais pressão devido à queda nas receitas fiscais, endividamento e o limitado acesso aos financiamentos internacionais. É imperioso que com urgência se reverta o atual cenário, aumentando o volume de financiamentos para intervenções de adaptação, resiliência climática e recuperação da economia e da vida pós Covid-19, de modo a voltar aos carrinhos nos nossos objetivos de desenvolvimento a médio e longo prazo. Os financiamentos disponíveis no contexto da resposta à emergência da Covid devem incluir também o alívio da dívida, apoio à liquidez orçamental e intervenções na resiliência e adaptação às mudanças climáticas. A agenda de financiar a adaptação às mudanças climáticas deve incluir programas específicos para induzir transformações transversais e sustentáveis na economia do ambiente, nas infraestruturas e em áreas sociais como saúde, educação, água e saneamento, agricultura e produção de alimentos, criação de empregos e resposta às calamidades naturais. Caros participantes, no diálogo do alto nível, Moçambique adotou a Estratégia Nacional de Adaptação e Mitigação das Mudanças Climáticas até ano 2025, que estabelece diretrizes de ação para criar resiliência, reduzir riscos climáticos nas comunidades e na economia nacional, bem como promover o desenvolvimento com baixo carbono e a economia verde através da sua integração no processo de planificação setorial e local. Aproveito a ocasião para, em nome dos moçambicanos, Agradecer aos, aos nossos parceiros internacionais de cooperação pelo estimável apoio que nos têm prestado para lidar com as mudanças climáticas. Entre esses parceiros está o Banco Africano de Desenvolvimento, organizador deste evento, que investiu acima de 200 milhões de dólares americanos em programas de resiliência climática nos últimos três anos em Moçambique, o que representa cerca de um terço do seu investimento total. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, o acesso universal a energias limpas, sustentáveis e de qualidade é um dos requisitos para o desenvolvimento dos povos de África. Por isso, somos por mais apoio para se maximizar as tecnologias de, de transição energética e o enorme potencial das energias renováveis abundantes no continente. Por outro lado, o gás natural, que muito bem pode servir de transição das energias fósseis para fontes de energias renováveis e mais limpas por ter baixo teor de emissões de carbono, deveria ser apoiado para acelerar o acesso universal à energia até 2030, em conformidade com as metas, com a meta aceita dos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável. E quero agradecer, muito obrigado pela atenção dispensada. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for your very comprehensive uh, uh, voice uh, at this uh, leaders' uh, dialogue. It is also a strong reminder, so as you highlighted uh, consistently, climate change is real, climate change is intensifying, it's here, we need to act now. Also, your reference to the impact on lives and livelihoods is, is, is fundamental. We need financing, we need planning, we need partnerships in all sectors. Your leadership is very widely recognized and acknowledged. And rest assured, also on behalf of President Adeshina of the African Development Bank, that this bold plan, which is on the table, is exactly trying to be here to support your leadership uh, in, in your country indeed. Let's go to our next speaker. Let's see whether um, this is an adaptation action in, 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 in real life to uh, Germany.
uh, we go to State Parliamentary State Secretary Maria Flachsbart on behalf of Germany. Germany has been a supporter and a friend of Africa for many years, particularly on climate adaptation. Let's listen to the message which State Secretary Flachsbart has for us. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this high-level dialogue is taking place in challenging times. The COVID-19 pandemic is showing its devastating impact worldwide, including in Africa. At the same time, climate change is having an ever greater impact on the African continent, threatening lives, economic development and ecosystems, and sharpening inequality. These impacts will continue to grow even when the pandemic is over. The most vulnerable are hit hardest by growing food insecurity, displacement and strained water resources, as well as by devastating floods and invasions of desert locusts. Thus, I'm all the more glad about this dialogue among African leaders and their partners who have gathered to send a joint and important signal. African leadership is confronting climate change charting a course towards more sustainable, greener economies and putting adaptation action high on the political agenda. I appreciate this strategic view and the concerted action led by the African Development Bank. Indeed, the AFDB has a key role to play, both in supporting a sustainable green recovery after the pandemic and in supporting Africa's path towards climate neutrality and resilience. Germany contributes to adaptation and resilience in Africa. In total, German financial contributions for adaptation to climate change in Africa amounted to over 540 million euros in 2019 alone. These measures include more readily available risk finance and insurance solutions such as those available under the African risk capacity. The ARC is an outstanding example of the successful implementation of the Insure Resilience Global Partnerships goals. ARC also is an example for the strong and partner-centered approach of the German Development Corporation. And there are further promising African initiatives, such as the African Adaptation Initiative, an initiative for which we pledged our support in September last year. It is in this context that we welcome the ongoing work on the African Adaptation Acceleration Program as a means to further increase the momentum and impact of the adaptation action in Africa. Last, not least, I'm sure that this strength in leadership and African cooperation is pointing to a promising African COP27, which will lead the way to a more resilient and a greener continent. We stand ready to support you in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Parliamentary State Secretary Maria Flassmet, on behalf of Germany. Your support to the Africa Adaptation Initiative, which we as Global Center on Adaptation, which we lead, uh, is absolutely vital. Also, your strong uh, commitment to help deliver on the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program between the African Development Bank and the Global Center on Adaptation in support of AAI is absolutely vital. Lastly, your reference to COP27, the Africa COP next year, because let us be clear, what we wish for is that after today's leadership dialogue, we go to the U.S. summit. From there, we go to COP26. But at COP27, we need to have the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program fully capitalized, indeed, in support of those African leaders who are with us here today. We're going now to a friend of Africa, and I would say that President Adashina would call her the sister of Africa. We go to Dr. Okonjo Iwala, recently appointed as the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Dr. Okonjo, what's your message to your continent? Excellencies, it's an honor to participate in the Leaders' Dialogue on Africa, COVID-19 and the Climate Emergency. 
I'm sorry I cannot join you in person. Africa made great progress in the last two decades with good reform programs and a relatively strong showing in terms of economic growth, along with landmark agreements such as the African Continental Free Trade Area. Yet, climate change and the current COVID-19 pandemic pose serious challenges that threaten to set the continent back. Parts of the continent are already warming much more quickly than the average, and droughts are becoming more frequent. Farmers and fishermen are hurting. We are seeing people pushed back into poverty. Yet Africa remains a continent with immense opportunities. If we act now to contain the pandemic, deal with the serious debt burdens, and work on plans and tools to tackle climate change. To defeat the pandemic, we must reverse the present global inequity in vaccine access. The greatest road to economic recovery and the best fiscal stimulus is access to vaccines. At the WTO, we are working hard to ensure unfettered supply chains scale up of vaccine manufacturing on the continent with transfer of technology and know-how. We are also working to ensure that trade within and outside Africa plays its part in the economic recovery. We shall support the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, whose rules are modeled on that of the WTO. We shall also support African entrepreneurs and their micro, medium, and small enterprises to join regional and global value chains. With respect to climate change, Africa's carbon emissions at 3% are the least in the world. Yet, the continent suffers greatly from the vagaries of climate change droughts, floods, pests, which all lead to displacement of our population. I saw so much of this during my five years as chair of the African Union's African Risk Capacity. Let me seize this opportunity to congratulate our leaders on creating this important organization to help manage the impact of climate change. Africa is commodity and fossil fuel dependent for its exports. And this exposes the continent to the volatility of the international marketplace. As the world reduces its dependence on fossil fuels, African countries on the road to COP26 must ask for a just transition. A period of time, several decades, sufficient to move economies to more climate-friendly technologies and the ensuing job opportunities. Investment and trade in key environmental goods and services can make climate adaptation much more affordable for Africa. The challenge of climate change and COVID-19 also bring opportunities, opportunities to invest in new technologies or to manufacture our own drugs and vaccines on the continent. Let us not miss out on these opportunities. Let's act now to ensure a better future for Africa. And as we do so, let's make sure we leave no one behind. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Okonjo Owela. I think I speak on behalf of all of us here in this uh, global gathering, how proud we are with you at the helm of the World Trade Organization, and also how reassured we are by putting trade at the center also of the climate adaptation agenda, particularly as it pertains to food security. Before we go to the next uh, speakers, I also would like to call upon the interpreters to open up their lines in terms of interpreting. It's good to interpret. If we can't hear you, it really is a lost uh, investment also on your side. So let's open the line. And before we do so, we go to the next leader on the continent indeed, President Ambalo, president of Guinea-Bissau. You're with us for already for, for, for a while on the continent. You know what it takes to move an agenda. Sir, what's your view? Excellence, Excellence, Madame d'État, Monsieur le Secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Président du Centre mondial pour l'adaptation, Monsieur le Président du gouvernement africain 
de développement, Madame la vice générale du Fonds monétaire international, Mesdames et Messieurs, la Guinée-Bissau, depuis 1995, date ratification de l'action cadre des Nations Unies sur la thématique par notre pays, régulièrement publié des communications nationales. La première a eu lieu en 2006, la deuxième en 2011 et la troisième en 2018. Notre pays a également élaboré en 2006 un plan d'action national d'adaptation au changement climatique. Pour relève l'ambition et plus récentement, la Guinée-Bissau a eu sa contribution prévue et déterminée à haut niveau national en 2015, en reprenant ses engagements relatifs à l'attenuation et l'adaptation au titre de l'accord de Paris. Par ailleurs, les trois communications nationales de la Guinée-Bissau a remis à jour les éléments la situation actuelle et les projets climatiques du pays, et même que les impacts du changement climatique et les principales volontés. Le premier rapport de mise à jour pénale pour un de notre pays a été publié à l'année dernière, 2020. Dans le cadre de l'accord de Paris et dans la perspective tenue prochaine de la COP26, les partis étaient encouragés à trouver ou à réviser les CPDN et vu de rendre l'engagement robuste, ambitieux et de se mettre en conformité avec les règles de Katowice adoptées lors de la COP24. Pour mener bien ce chantier, la Guinée-Bissau tient l'appui de partenaires techniques et financiers, notamment celui de la CDAO, père du programme GCA, Afrique Plus, de celui de Nude. La Guinée-Bissau ce processus de vision de la CPN a démarré en 2020. Une contribution déterminée au niveau national sera présentée lors de la crise à Glasgow. Excellence, Mesdames, Messieurs, en relance cette crise post-COVID-19 de l'adaptation climatique repose sur la stratégie de développement du pays. Une stratégie qui a été élaborée à partir de différents documents stratégiques sectoriels, déclinés dans le cadre de la programmation triennale du développement de la Guinée-Bissau, dénominée Orachiga 2020-2023. La problématique globale du financement à laquelle s'est ajoutée la crise engendrée par la pandémie de COVID-19 et ses impacts négatifs sur notre économie font qu'aujourd'hui la Guinée-Bissau est confronté à des choix qui représentent à la fois des défis et des opportunités. Nous considérons en fait que toute relance économique doit être socialement équitable, durable, résilient et autre du point de vue climatique que nous voulons mettre en œuvre les objectifs ambitieux de l'accord de Paris et atteindre les objectifs de développement durable contenus dans l'agenda 2030 de même que l'agenda 2053 de l'Union africaine et ainsi le New Deal et la feuille de route de Samoa. Notre réponse concentrée à la COVID-19 et nos efforts conjugués en vue de relance économique de nos pays respectifs après la pandémie constituent une occasion unique pour l'Afrique de représenter la transition vers une économie circulaire, plus verte et résiliente au changement climatique. Nous sommes d'avis que nos pays respectifs doivent privilégier et créer des partenariats solides et dynamiques afin d'assurer la résilience climatique, car aucun pays ni aucune institution en Afrique ne peut agir seul avec les partenariats tels que les fonds vers le climat, les fonds d'adaptation et autres constituent des relais d'opportunités renforcer et accélérer l'adaptation au changement climatique sur notre continent. Permettez-moi, en nom de son Excellence, Président Mbalo, 
de rappeler pour terminer que la jeunesse africaine avait l'esprit innovateur du interpartenariat et construit la force motrice pour conduire et soutenir la transition vers une économie claire ouverte. Cette jeunesse aspire à être écoutée et pleinement associée, posséder la volonté, l'énergie et la capacité de contribuer valablement à la promotion d'un continent résilient aux défis climatiques au cours de la décennie en cours. Je vous remercie et merci. Thank you so much, Mr. President Mbala. I mean, this was extremely uh, powerful and, and, and visionary. You would like to, to, to make additional points, please feel free, sir. But we, my takeaway, sir, from your, from your message is we have no time to waste. We need to realize that COVID and climate together is impacting the economy, the health, the food security, and also we need to work together. We need a Green New Deal for Africa indeed. And what we put on the table, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program tries to speak to that particular agenda. I'm extremely grateful, uh, sir, for your leadership and for your strong voice on this agenda. Please count on us in supporting you moving forward. I would like to go to our next leader on the continent, in fact, also a global leader, President Usman of Comoros. President, are you with us, sir? We have a technical glitch. We will resolve it. Uh, stay with us. Let's go quickly to our uh, colleague and friend from the World Bank Group, the Vice President, Vice President Diagana. What's the message from the World Bank? We've heard the African Development Bank. We've seen the leadership of President Adeshina. Let's listen now to the World Bank Group, what their commitment to this agenda is. It's a great pleasure to join all of you at this session of the Global Center for Adaptation Africa. The World Bank welcomes your new initiative, the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, uh, whose goal is to galvanize climate resilient actions to address challenges of the COVID pandemic, climate change, and the economy. This goal is noble and so urgent. The World Bank fully agrees that bold transformative action at scale is needed for Africa through collective action with partners and under country leadership. Indeed, nowhere will the negative effect of the three C's, climate, COVID, and conflict be felt more than in Sub-Saharan Africa. One stark example is that uh, climate change is expected to lead to 85 million internal climate migrants by 2050 if no concerted climate and development action is taken. To address climate change impact in Sub-Saharan Africa, we, the World Bank, have defined a next generation Africa climate business plan, which was launched in September 2020. And this plan sets out a blueprint for development centered climate action over the next six years, 2021, 2026. The plan focuses on five transformative interventions in Africa boosting. One, food security. Two, clean energy. Three, green and resilient cities. Four, environment stability. And five, management of climate shocks. Through our portfolio, the plan will drive systemic and transformative shift including the promotion of climate and foreign macroeconomic policies. The plan will support also countries' new ambition and their nationally determined contribution by linking the bank comparative advantage of delivering policy reform with investment that support action at scale and leverage with the private sector. At the World Bank, we stand ready to deepen our partnership with our client countries development partner and the global center for adaptation africa to meet the urgency for climate action thank you for your attention well thank you so much for this very strong uh, contribution of the world bank i think i also speak on behalf of the african development bank we at the global center on adaptation of course are keen to the world bank and other development partners we all have to come together 
on the continent to support African nations delivering on this ambition indeed. Let's turn to an icon, a president of Zimbabwe, a president who is leading on climate adaptation, a president who is leading on the economic recovery. President Ngagwa, how can we support you in this journey, sir? Thank you. Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, President of the African World Bank and the Co-Chair, Dr. Antisina, Chair of the Global Center for Adaptation, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Your Excellencies, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address this leaders' dialogue on the impact of COVID-19 on climate change in Africa. Climate change is indeed emerging as one of the greatest developmental challenges of our time. Regrettably, Africa has not been spared from the dire impacts of changing weather patterns and the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the situation. Science informs us that climate change is here to stay. Thus, there is urgent need for Africa to have long-term strategies to guide the transition towards green and climate-resilient economies. This process requires blending our adaptation options and the climate change mitigation actions through the implementation of nationally determined contributions. These interventions require financial and technical resources. In the case of Zimbabwe, an ambitious target has been set to green the economy by the year 2030. Whilst the climate change, adaptation and resilience has been mainstreamed in all sectors. In addition, the country has crafted a long-term low emission development strategy, which provides a range of options to contribute to the climate change goal of eliminating the global temperatures increase. Investments in climate proofing agriculture, water harvesting infrastructure, and renewable energy are now most urgent. The current scenario that calls for national adaptation programs to be complemented by the mobilization of additional resources to enable countries to recover from COVID-19 related economic growth slippages. It is also imperative that we adapt innovative and find consensus at the regional, continental, and global level to deal with the current stock of atmospheric carbon. The excellent work by the Africa Development Bank and the Global Center for Adaptation, the United Nations and African Union, respectively, with regards to climate change adaptation and mitigation is most commendable. Attempts should continue towards ensuring that these well-intended programs are in sync with the aspirations of COP26. That way, we will together create a better world for us all. I thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, also for reminding us that we need to mainstream climate considerations into all sectors. That comprehensive vision, what you have, certainly resonates. I think, can, can I just also speak on your behalf, uh, Mr. President Adashina, maybe a quick reflection on your side? I was just going to thank my big brother from Zimbabwe, Tatenda, uh, Mr. President, uh, for, for what you said. I think... Uh, the key from what I'm hearing is the okay, importance me, uh, of actually linking agriculture 
um, and energy. I think that's important that we see, you know, if you have renewable energy in design or dry places, we can actually have solar powered irrigation system that will, that will turn the Sahel and other places into green, the green vast areas. And we hear about the importance of climate proofing agriculture, again, the importance of drought uh, and, and flood tolerant crops and uh, uh, for farmers. Uh, we hear very clearly uh, the uh, need to support the Africa risk capacity. Um, this is something that the African Development Bank actually helped to create, uh, supporting the African Union, and where we have the Africa Disaster Risk Financing Facility that supports countries to actually pay insurance to, to insure themselves against catastrophic risk events. So I think it's an urgent call to actually have donors and, and partners mobilize resources so that African countries that are actually more vulnerable will be able to pay and insure themselves against this catastrophic risk event. We have the platform, we need the resources for that. We have very clearly the importance of partnership and we look forward to working with the World Bank and other multilateral developing banks and other uh, public development banks on this agenda. We had very, very clearly the importance of just transition again, which was the point that was made by the UN Secretary General Guterres, uh, the importance to understand that energy transition will take time, energy mix matters, and the importance of actually having financing to support African countries to make that kind of transition. And finally, um, is the issue of Africa's COP, you know, and the fact that there's massive support uh, for the African Adaptation Accelerated, uh, Af African uh, uh, Accelerated Adaptation uh, Program uh, being critical for countries, but that we should make sure we have our eyes on COP26, of course, in Glasgow, but looking to the Africa uh, coming up in 2022, that we will have mobilized all the resources that are needed to ensure that uh, they, we actually hit the ground at that time to support fully all African countries. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Anashina. Very well said uh, on, on sketching the journey ahead of us uh, indeed. Let us go back to the president of Comoros, President Asuman. You have your challenges in uh, Comoros like other nations have as well, in this case, sea level rise. What is your vision, uh, sir? How can we move forward? How can we help? What is needed? Sir, you have the floor, Mr. President. Merci de me donner la parole. Monsieur le chef d'État, Monsieur le Président des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Président de l'Union africaine, Madame la directrice générale du FMI, Monsieur le Président du groupe de la Banque africaine de développement, Monsieur le Président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, Monsieur le Président du Centre mondial de l'adaptation, ancien secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Co-président. De prime abord, permettez-moi de vous remercier d'avoir pris cette belle initiative, d'organiser cette réunion d'échange en espérant que les résultats escomptés s'avéreront concluants pour nos pays. Et permettez-moi de remercier et de féliciter tous mes prédécesseurs pour leur allocution pertinente dans le fond auquel je partage entièrement ce qui va me permettre d'être bref dans mon allocution. Mais je voudrais souligner que la pandémie COVID-19 nous a appris d'être solidaires et qu'on ne doit pas attendre la COVID-20 ou 20 ou 21 pour être solidaire. Et c'est pourquoi la nécessité de s'adapter rapidement au changement climatique doit nous unir instamment, car la problématique des changements climatiques, c'est un problème qui se pose partout dans le monde et surtout dans les petits États insulaires en développement dont mon pays fait partie. En effet, les hausses des températures, mais aussi les pluies violentes et les inondations causent la destruction des maisons, de cultures, d'infrastructures et occasionnent différentes pathologies et épidémies. En effet, l'Union des Comores, mon pays, est particulièrement affectée par des phénomènes météorologiques extrêmes et notamment les éruptions du volcan, dont celui de 90 de 77 qui a détruit tout un village, et celui de 2005 qui a eu des conséquences catastrophiques pour le pays, mais aussi l'érosion des sols, particulièrement en montagne, ainsi que l'élévation du niveau de la mer. En 2019, nous avons, suivi, nous avons subi le cyclone Kenneth, 
qui a causé beaucoup de dégâts humains et de matériels ou de problèmes socio-économiques. Ainsi, pour s'adapter au changement climatique, les pays, comme tous les pays du monde, s'attellent au développement des énergies nouvelles renouvelables. Et fort heureusement, les potentialités existent dans notre pays, et notamment le domaine du solaire, de l'hydraulique et de la géothermie. Et compte tenu de l'insularité de mon pays, qui rend difficile les échanges entre les îles, nous concentrons nos efforts également sur la construction d'infrastructures portuaires et aéroportuaires aux normes internationales pour améliorer la circulation et la sécurité des personnes et des biens. Et par ailleurs, pour conclure, la pandémie de la COVID-19 a renforcé notre vision de consolider les structures de santé et les infrastructures sanitaires de l'ensemble du territoire, notamment par la finalisation de la construction de notre hôpital de référence et la mise en place d'un service de veille épidémiologique. La mise en place d'un système de gestion des déchets constitue également une priorité des pays insulaires, y compris le mien, le mien, le mien propre. Ainsi, vu l'ampleur des défis à relever, l'accompagnement des institutions et des fonds internationaux s'avère nécessaire, surtout que la crise sanitaire mondiale liée à la COVID-19 est venu mettre à mal les économies de notre pays. En attendant, je me permets de plaider en faveur d'un transfert de compétences entre nos pays, ainsi que d'un appui multiforme en vue du renforcement des capacités dans tous les domaines, afin de réussir ce combat commun pour l'atténuation, l'adaptation et la résilience au changement climatique dans l'intérêt de nos pays et de nos peuples. Je vous remercie. Well, thank you so much, uh, President Assouma, and also referencing the importance of capacity building and the importance of this, not just for the country, but for the people in the country. It is a very much people-centered agenda indeed, and I thank you for your leadership. Let's move back to Europe. In fact, let's move to Paris. Let's see whether our good friend Rémi Rieu is with us as we speak. And indeed, Rémi Rieu, of course, we all uh, know him and admire him, the CEO of the French uh, Agency for Development uh, in, 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 in France. You're also um, uh, a board member of the Global Center on Adaptation. Rémi, you've been driving this agenda for many, many years. You're really a friend of Africa. The AFD is a friend of Africa, is a strong supporter and partner of the African Development Bank. What's your vision of success? What is needed? And particularly, how can we partner? Monsieur le chef d'État et de gouvernement, Monsieur le Président de la, de la Banque africaine de développement, Monsieur le Président du, du GCA, Excellence, je suis extrêmement honoré de, de participer au nom du Président de la République française à ce dialogue sur l'urgence climatique en Afrique. Le Président Emmanuel Macron, dont chacun sait l'engagement pour votre continent et pour le climat, regrette de ne pouvoir être présent mais a tenu à ce que soient portés dans cette enceinte les trois messages suivants. D'abord, un message d'attention. L'Afrique est en première ligne dans notre recherche commune de solutions pour le climat et l'Afrique nous inspire. Vous exercez un leadership global qui s'est exprimé avec force aujourd'hui même et qui s'exprimera plus fortement encore par vos contributions nationales lors de la COP26. Je pense aussi à l'initiative AREI pour les énergies renouvelables, dont le champion est le président Alpha Condé. Je pense au programme de la Grande Muraille Verte, lancé lors du One Planet Summit en janvier, à l'initiative Desert to Power, que porte avec force le président Adessina, et qui, à terme, feront du Sahel l'une des plus grandes zones de production d'énergie solaire au monde, dont bénéficieront 250 millions de personnes, car le social ne s'oppose pas à l'environnemental. Mon deuxième message est celui de l'ambition. Le financement des économies africaines doit être ambitieux en quantité et en qualité, 
C'est l'objet du sommet sur le financement des économies africaines qui sera organisé le 18 mai prochain à Paris. Ce sommet travaillera pour apporter à court terme plus de ressources publiques et aussi à mobiliser le secteur privé africain. Il permettra aussi d'ancrer les enjeux de durabilité, notamment la question de l'adaptation au changement climatique, dans le financement des trajectoires de développement des pays africains. Enfin, je souhaite porter un message de coopération. La France, via l'AFD, s'engage aux côtés de l'Afrique et de ses banques publiques de développement. L'AFD a mobilisé au cours des cinq dernières années plus de 8 milliards d'euros d'investissement pour le climat en Afrique, dont déjà un tiers en faveur de l'adaptation. Et il faut faire plus, bien sûr, et investir aux côtés des 95 banques publiques de développement africaines dans chacun de vos États qui jouent un rôle contracyclique et un rôle de long terme. Et nous savons pouvoir compter sur la première d'entre elles, la Banque africaine de développement, et en particulier sur son programme d'accélération de l'adaptation en Afrique que nous soutenons pleinement. Les banques publiques de développement africaines ont un rôle clé à jouer pour préparer et pour financer beaucoup plus de projets qu'aujourd'hui. Lors du sommet Finance en commun, au mois de novembre dernier, nous avons lancé une coalition des 450 banques publiques de développement du monde qui se sont engagées pour la première fois à intégrer pleinement l'adaptation et la résilience dans leur stratégie et dans leurs opérations. Cette coalition rendra compte de ces projets lors du prochain sommet Finance en commun qui se tiendra à l'automne 2021 en Italie. Nous y parlerons bien sûr beaucoup d'Afrique et d'adaptation. Je vous remercie. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, CEO Rémi Rio, on behalf of President uh, Macron. President Macron is not with us here today, but I know he's with us here in spirit, and the message which you just delivered on behalf of uh, Mr. President Macron is absolutely well received. Ambition, think both about quality and quantity, and also let's not forget the role of public development banks on the continent, of which obviously the Africa Development Bank is in a leadership role, bringing along the other public development banks also at this action forcing event in May, which President Macron is convening indeed. Let's go back to Africa. Let's go back to the Seychelles. Let's go back to President Ram Kalawan. Sir, you are the chair of the African Union Climate Change Commission on the island states in addition to your important role as a leader of your nation. What's your vision of success? How can we collaborate? What do you need from us to make this agenda real, tangible, concrete? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies. It is indeed uh, a great honor for me to be part of this uh, leaders' dialogue. The COVID-19 pandemic may be the most uh, important and uh, pressing challenge facing humanity right now. But uh, for us, especially as an island state, climate change remains the biggest long-term threat. The adverse impacts of climate change are deeply felt in island nations where sea level rise, coastal erosion, coral bleaching, and even the disappearance of some of our islands, amongst others, are real threats to our livelihood. As we respond to the threats of COVID for urgent and immediate action, we cannot forget the multiple systemic shocks that are now threatening African communities a health crisis, a food security crisis, and an economic crisis, all compounded by the climate crisis. Africa is facing a lot of challenges, but though the continent is being battered, we have to remain conscious of our contribution in combating climate change. 
It is only our solidarity and commitment that will bring global success. The combination of COVID-19 and climate impacts have severely devastated our economies. Countries around the world have uh, collectively allocated over $20 trillion in COVID stimulus packages, thereby reducing the resources av available to combat climate change. Climate change cannot wait while we address COVID-19. This must be addressed together and demands an urgent response. In Seychelles, the government is committed to building a climate start resilient country to enable this transformation in all aspects. Our critical infrastructure, food security, coastal and marine resources and water security are amongst the most vulnerable to climate change impacts. The critical need to enhance knowledge and understanding of climate change, the vulnerabilities and adaptation solutions, together with the sufficient financial support, are key elements to achieving the needed resilience in the country. Seychelles has indeed deployed significant financial resources to scale up adaptation efforts in our national development strategy. We have aligned this strategy with future expected impacts of climate change. Protecting the environment through needed sacrifice has seen us as a small country set aside 30% of our EZ and 50% of our limited land mass to nature protection. And we are committed to doing more as we lead by example. In this context, I want to commend the African Development Bank for its commitment to allocate $25 billion to climate change between 2020 and 2025. We are in that team. I welcome and commend the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program to scale up and, and accelerate adaptation in Africa. Such programs act as beacons of hope for humanity, especially for our mother Africa. I am pleased to note that AAP has already identified projects that will be of benefit to Seychelles, but not only Seychelles. As, our, as my friend from the Comoros in the same region has mentioned, to small island states. And these include, for example, the development of a toolkit for the design and implementation of climate smart digital technologies for agriculture, including last mile capacity building material for farmers that will be critical in assisting its agricultural producers to climate risks. Secondly, the development of a massive online open course on adaptation and climate change that will be able to support the youth of Seychelles to design and implement adaptation solutions and take part in the country's efforts. I call on development partners to urgently allocate more resources to adaptation in Africa in general and to the AAP. The COVID-19 stimulus packages should not deprive African countries of the resources needed for climate change. Climate change initiatives should help us to build forward, better, greener, and safer. Strengthening Africa and the seeds resilience to climate change can provide major opportunities. If this cannot be done as a continent, we will fail to do so as a world. Let us come together, this is my call. Let us come together as it is our mission to protect the planet for today's and future generations. Let us do the absolute best through global solidarity. It is no longer 
about me, myself, and I, but it is about us as a global community. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, President Ramkalawan, for being an inspiration for all of us, not only in this meeting, not only on the continent, but for the globe as a whole. You mentioned, sir, that the African Adaptation Acceleration Program is a beacon of hope. Well, let us yeah. say back, you're a beacon of hope for Africa and for the world with your strong visionary leadership. It's clear, as you mentioned, sir, that small island st states have their own challenges, but there are also specific solutions pertinent for small islands uh, uh, developing states which need to go to scale. Count on us in this journey indeed. Let's go to the next leader, bold leader on the African continent, President Cabaret, President of Burkina Faso. Sir, what's your vision? What is needed? Uh, Mr. President, you may be on mute. We cannot hear you. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, much better. Excellent. Okay. Excellence, mesdames et messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, Monsieur Antonio Guterres, secrétaire général de l'Organisation des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Président de la Banque africaine de développement, Madame la directrice du Fonds monétaire international, distinguées personnalités honorables invités, mesdames et messieurs. Je suis Siméo Sawadogo. Ministre de l'Environnement, de l'Économie verte et du changement climatique. C'est au nom de son Excellence, M. Rock Marc Christian Cabore, président du FASO, qui a eu une contrainte de dernière minute, que j'ai l'honneur de vous livrer son message à l'ouverture de ses travaux. Et je cite Le Burkina Faso voudrait exprimer sa reconnaissance et toute sa gratitude pour cette opportunité qui lui est offerte de participer à ce dialogue de haut niveau. Consacré à l'urgence COVID-19 et climatique en Afrique, cette rencontre nous offre l'occasion de réaffirmer notre engagement à accélérer et renforcer les mesures d'adaptation en Afrique en nous penchant sur nos besoins prioritaires de renforcement des actions et de financement et de partenariats. Les conclusions de ce dialogue renforceront sans nul doute notre participation à la 26e conférence des partis COP26 sur le climat prévu en novembre prochain à Glasgow, en Écosse. Distingués invités, mesdames et messieurs, l'année 2019 a été non seulement marquée par l'apparition de la COVID-19, mais a été aussi la deuxième année la plus chaude de l'histoire, selon un rapport récent de l'Organisation Météorologique Mondiale. L'humanité qui se trouve face à l'urgence climatique et celle de la pandémie de la, pandémie de la COVID-19 doit agir de manière concertée en renforçant ses capacités de résilience afin d'atteindre des objectifs majeurs de développement durable. Il nous faut agir vite si nous voulons inverser la tendance actuelle. Pour lutter contre cette pandémie, le gouvernement du Burkina Faso, avec l'appui de ses partenaires, a adopté et mis en œuvre plusieurs mesures sanitaires et socio-économiques pour y faire face. Malgré tous les efforts et l'engagement de la communauté internationale, la vulnérabilité de nos pays au changement climatique et la pandémie de la COVID-19 ont impacté durablement nos économies et les perspectives de développement en Afrique. Les lieux d'espoir qu'offre le vaccin dans la lutte contre la corona, doivent être consolidés en aidant l'Afrique à assurer la sécurité sanitaire de ses populations. Distingués invités, mesdames et messieurs, l'humanité qui se trouve aussi confrontée à l'urgence climatique doit agir de manière concertée si nous voulons préserver l'avenir. Cela passe par le renforcement des capacités d'adaptation et de résilience aux effets néfastes des changements climatiques. Cela passe également par la facilitation d'accès aux différents fonds climat et aux différentes initiatives. Il y a également l'appui aux actions prioritaires définies par les trois commissions sur le climat en Afrique, à savoir la commission climat pour le Sahel, la commission de la région du bassin du Congo et la commission des États insulaires. De façon concrète, il nous faut concevoir et mettre en œuvre 
des programmes opérationnels tels que la gestion durable des terres, l'amélioration à l'accès à l'énergie propre, la réduction de la pollution de l'air, la sécurité alimentaire, la préservation de la diversité biologique. Le Burkina Faso, dans cette dynamique, avec des engagements, a des engagements ambitieux et reflété par son plan national d'adaptation au changement climatique et sa contribution donc déterminée au niveau national et au niveau international. Distingués invités, mesdames et messieurs, le Burkina Faso salue les nombreuses, les nombreuses initiatives créées à l'échelle internationale et en Afrique pour faire face à l'urgence COVID-19 et climatique. Mon pays soutient particulièrement le programme d'accélération de l'adaptation en Afrique, PAA, de la Banque africaine de développement et le Centre mondial pour l'adaptation. Je reste convaincu que cette initiative destinée à mobiliser 25 milliards de dollars américains pour intensifier les mesures d'adaptation aux effets du changement climatique va booster les actions de résilience en Afrique. Je fonde l'espoir que ce présent dialogue aboutisse à des résultats concrets favorables au renforcement de la résilience de notre continent au changement climatique dans un contexte marqué par la crise sanitaire de la COVID-19. C'est dans cet espoir que je vous invite pour qu'ensemble, nous œuvrons pour une action climatique plus ambitieuse malgré la crise sanitaire. Plein succès à nos travaux et je vous remercie. Fin de citation et merci pour votre aimable attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister. On behalf of uh, President Kabere, please share our congratulations with the President for his strong leadership, its endorsement of the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, but also highlighting the importance of sustainable land management as a critical component of the action agenda indeed. Let us see, yes indeed, President Zoidi, uh, wonderful, thank you so much Madam President for joining us today during this very important uh, dialogue. You were with us last September with President Arishina when we launched uh, the GCA Africa uh, uh, office. You were with us during the Climate Adaptation Summit in January. In short, you're with us on this agenda. Madam President, what's your view? You know what the direction of travel is. What can we do bolder, faster, more impactful? Mm -hmm. Madam President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, my brother, Dr. Akimimi Adesina, President of the African Development Bank and the Chair of the Global Center on Adaptation, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, for your invitation and for your strong leadership. Climate change is compromising Africa's growth. In its efforts to transition, to carbon neutrality, the international community is paying very little attention to the vulnerability of poor developing countries, the real victims of the climate change. My region, East Africa, for instance, has been battling swarms of desert locusts that have devastated thousands of hectares of cropland. The perennial droughts and an encroaching desert that have laid bare the vulnerability of the entire Horn of Africa. Ethiopia has experienced several drought episodes between 1965 and 2015, some of which posed a major threat to the livelihoods of the poor. In response, we've invested significantly in building resilience through initiatives such as climate resilience and green economy strategy, the productive safety net program, the household asset building program, the sustainable land management program, and resilience landscape livelihoods project. We've gone further to declare our commitment to the climate neutral by 2025, and we aim to generate jobs in the process by overhauling our rural economy to support more sustainable agriculture and generate millions of hectares of degrade, degraded forest. As part of our commitment to the Paris Agreement, we have also launched our 15-year ambitious 
National Adaptation Plan, aimed at reducing the vulnerability of the country to the adverse impacts of climate change. This plan has identified 18 options across most vulnerable sectors, including agriculture, forestry, health, as well as transport. We are finalizing the process of updating its nationally determined contribution, as well as the preparation for the 2050 long-term low carbon development strategy, despite the challenges posed by COVID-19. While grappling with climate change and its impacts, COVID-19 took us all by surprise. The combination of climate change with its devastations and the economic downturns from COVID-19 have challenged two decades of progress the continent has made in the past. I commend the solidarity that the global community has shown in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic, investing over 30 trillion thus far in COVID-19 stimulus packages. I wish that we all could demonstrate the same political will to mobilize the much lesser amounts needed to combat climate change. We can start by reaffirming our commitments to mobilize 100 billion per year in climate finance to support developing countries. I commend the African Development Bank and the Global Center on Adaptation for launching the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program to mobilize 25 billion to scale up transformative actions on climate adaptation on the continent. Its implementation will significantly scale up and accelerate adaptation in Africa. As we head towards COP26, let us not just talk, but walk the talk. We need action on the ground. I wish to end by calling on all partners to support the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program towards a successful contribution at COP26. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam President, for your very strong and bold words, also for your wisdom in moving forward. Indeed, action on the ground, that's exactly what we need, and that's also what, exactly what we intend to do in the coming months, translating words into concrete action. Is that not right, Mr. President of the African Development Bank? Uh, indeed. Let's go to the Foreign Minister of Nigeria, uh, Foreign Minister, Minister Onyema. You're speaking on behalf of your president. Please, what's the message you want to bring to this uh, meeting, sir? You might be muted, uh, sir. Okay. Well. Okay, can you hear me now? Very well indeed. Sir, you, we know you're a bold leader, so give us your message. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, President Muhammad Buhari very much wanted to uh, be part of this very important dialogue, but had to travel out of the country at very short notice. And as you say, he's asked me to deliver his statement. So uh, his statement is this. Uh, Excellencies, heads of state and government, President, African Development Bank, our own uh, Dr. Akimumi Adeshina, the chair of the board, uh, Global Center for Adaptation, Ban Ki-moon, uh, CEO, Global Center for Adaptation, ladies and gentlemen. Let me uh, begin by thanking the African Development Bank, uh, the Global Center for Adaptation, and the United Nations for organizing this very important meeting. The theme of this meeting, Leaders' Dialogue on the Africa COVID Climate Emergency, is extremely apt at this time, uh, taking into account the devastating combined effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate change on our continent. Nigeria is very pleased to note the initiatives advanced by the uh, African Development Bank and the Global Center for Adaptation. These strategies ensure that Africa's recovery from the combined effects of COVID-19 and climate change are holistic, resilient, harmonious, and reflective of the peculiarities and priorities of our continent. International support in this regard is essential to guarantee that no part of the world is left behind in the global recovery effort. 
We're therefore delighted to be part of this frank and constructive dialogue on cooperation amongst African leaders. Excellencies, our gathering today is a testimony to our collective commitment to move the African continent out of the doldrums of COVID-19 and climate change and set her on the path of total recovery. We recall that before the pandemic, the world had been reeling under the devastating effects of climate change. Some of these effects include global warming, floods, droughts, storms, rising sea levels and melting glaciers that directly harm animals and destroy natural habitats, while also wreaking havoc on people's lives and livelihoods. In addition, climate change has contributed to rising insurgency and armed conflict on the continent, with resultant displacement of persons and livelihoods. The situation of the Lake Chad Basin is an example of the risks and effects associated with climate change. So Nigeria welcomes wholeheartedly the launch of the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program as an initiative to address regional adaptation gaps and support the transition of countries to low carbon development pathways. Being one of the most vulnerable nations, Nigeria will not hesitate to leverage on this program to forestall the exacerbating impact of climate change. Your Excellencies, nowhere are the adverse impacts of climate change felt more than in Africa where millions of smallholder farmers rely upon their land for their lives and livelihoods. Multiple systemic shocks are now threatening African communities at the same time. We have a health crisis, a food crisis, security crisis, an economic crisis, and all these compounded by the climate crisis. The combination of COVID-19 and climate impact have severely devastated our economy. Countries around the world have collectively allocated over $20 trillion in COVID stimulus packages, thereby reducing the resources available to combat climate change. Climate change cannot wait while we address COVID-19. They must be addressed together. Nigeria's development is already highly undermined by climate change impact, with, for example, the big flood of 2012 causing damage of as much as 1.4% of Nigeria's real GDP growth in that year. Together with drought, changing rainfall patterns, and sea level rising, Nigeria's nationally determined contribution highlights these as main climate risks. With agricultural yields expected to decline between 10 and 25% by 2080 on average, and in the North, by up to 50%, food security is therefore likely to be further undermined while imports would increase. With Lake Chad shrinking to less than 40% of the population that, um, that has direct access to portable water is expected to further decrease. A rising sea level of one meter by 2100 could lead to a loss of 75% of Nigeria's delta area. It's clear, therefore, that strong adaptation action must be implemented to build resilience. We have therefore deployed significant financial resources to scale up adaptation efforts. We have mainstreamed adaptation into our national development strategy. We have aligned this strategy with future expected impacts of climate change. We commend the African Development Bank for providing some of these resources and for its com uh, commitment to allocate $25 billion to climate change between 2020 and 2025. This, however, is obviously still not enough compared to the needs on the continent. Current estimates of the cost of climate change to Africa are between seven to $15 billion per year and this could rise to $40 billion per year by 2040. Certainly, we welcome and commend the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, jointly developed and implemented by the Global Center on Adaptation and the African Development Bank to scale up and accelerate adaptation in Africa. It also seeks to mobilize an additional $12.5 billion to finance adaptation on the continent. 
strengthening Africa's resilience to climate change will also strengthen its resilience to COVID-19 and other pandemics that may emerge in the future. So we're pleased to see that Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program has already identified projects that will be of benefit to Nigeria and other African countries. These are, some of these are the formal artisans upgrades and medium, small and micro enterprises fostering program, which aims to support artisan workers to strengthen their businesses and scale up their efforts while responding to climate threats in order to drive resilient economic development. And there's the, the Africa Disaster Risk Financing Program, which will support Nigeria's producers' resilience and response to climate shocks by improving disaster risk management and adaptation to climate change. And if this receives sufficient resources, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program should aim to mobilize and deploy at least 100 million US dollars in disaster risk financing through Africa Disaster Risk Financing Program integrated into at least 15 country operations across three regions. So with sufficient resources, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program should be able to support Nigeria's adaptation priority to strengthen its coastal resilience and delta management by supporting national level infrastructure assessments and planning and the development of bankable projects in implementing strategies for improved resource management, support sector specific strategies, policies, programs and measures in such areas of agriculture, fresh water resources, coastal and water resources and fisheries, forest uh, di biodiversity, health and sanitation, human settlements and housing, energy, transportation and communication, industry and commerce, disaster, migration and security, livelihoods, vulnerable groups, education, etc. So it really can have an impact right across the board. So we call on development partners to urgently allocate more resources to adaptation in Africa in general and to the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program in particular to enable them to address Africa's huge vulnerability to the adverse impact of climate change and other emerging pandemics. The COVID-19 stimulus packages should not and I repeat, should not deprive African countries of the resources needed for climate change. Climate change should be mainstreamed into stimulus packages to African countries in order to build forward better. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention. Thank you so much, sir, uh, Mr. Minister, on behalf of President Buhari for his very comprehensive vision, your action, your boldness. You know what is needed. You know where you need to partner. African Development Bank, Global Center on Adaptation, we're here for you. Let's accelerate also our meeting, uh, but not after sp uh, listening to Chairman Faki. Chairman Faki of the African Union Commission is with us today. Let's see whether we can get Mr. Faki on the screen, please. Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs, distingués participants. Je voudrais avant tout remercier les organisateurs de ce dialogue qui s'inscrit dans la suite du sommet sur l'adaptation au changement climatique qui s'est tenu le 25 et le 26 janvier 2021. Ce dialogue offre donc l'occasion d'échanger sur les besoins du continent en matière d'adaptation. Le changement climatique, faut-il le rappeler, affecte l'ensemble du continent avec des conséquences qui menacent d'inverser les acquis de développement et mettre en péril les efforts en cours pour atteindre les objectifs de développement de l'agenda 2063. Il impacte tous les secteurs économiques, notamment l'agriculture, l'élevage, la sécurité alimentaire, la santé et l'énergie, les infrastructures, les villes et les écosystèmes. Le changement climatique est également en partie à l'origine des sanglants conflits intercommunautaires et fonciers, à l'instabilité et aux migrations. Ces impacts deviennent encore plus complexes en raison des nouvelles dynamiques engendrées 
par les conséquences aussi économiques de la COVID-19. Dans une malheureuse complémentarité, la COVID-19 et les aléas naturels ont donc aggravé la gestion des risques de catastrophe et de la pandémie de la COVID elle-même. Les inondations et les sécheresses ont, par exemple, entraîné des mouvements massifs de population ayant compromis le respect des mesures barrières dans la lutte contre la COVID-19 et contribué ainsi à une forte propagation de la pandémie. En raison de contraintes budgétaires dans lesquelles se sont retrouvés de nombreux États africains, les ressources existantes ont été réaffectées à la COVID-19, limitant de fait les réponses à d'autres secteurs en lien avec la crise climatique. La pandémie a également introduit de nouveaux défis dans la mise en œuvre de l'accord de Paris. Elle a exercé une pression supplémentaire sur la nature et les ressources naturelles en raison de la perte de revenus provenant habituellement d'autres sources telles que la production agricole, le commerce informel et le tourisme écologique. <coughs> Par conséquent, le fonctionnement des écosystèmes essentiels à notre bien-être et aux moyens de subsistance des communautés demeure continuellement menacé. Mesdames, Messieurs, face à ces défis, la Commission de l'Union africaine a récemment élaboré un plan d'action pour une relance verte de l'Union africaine qui sera lancée au courant de ce mois. Ce plan d'action couvre cinq domaines prioritaires, à savoir le financement du climat, les soutiens aux énergies renouvelables, les solutions fondées sur la nature et la biodiversité, une agriculture résiliente, des villes vertes et résilientes. Ces domaines prioritaires sont fondamentaux et essentiels pour renforcer la résilience de l'Afrique et pour assurer une croissance durable. Le plan d'action pour une relance verte de l'Union africaine vise également à soutenir les initiatives en cours qui sont liées à l'adaptation au changement climatique. Il s'agit des initiatives en faveur d'une agriculture résiliente au changement climatique, du renforcement de la résilience des communautés dans les zones rurales d'Afrique par le biais du projet de la Grande Muraille Verte pour le Sahara et le Sahel et le programme de réduction des risques de catastrophe. En complément des efforts fournis, l'Union africaine a lancé un programme visant à fournir des informations météorologiques et climatiques pour le processus de prise de décision et pour une planification de développement. Ce programme profitera également, profitera également aux services météorologiques nationaux pour leur dotation en équipement moderne. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, l'adaptation est une priorité pour l'Afrique. C'est pour cette raison que le comité des chefs d'État et du gouvernement africain sur le changement climatique a approuvé la mise en place de l'initiative pour l'adaptation en Afrique, comme l'un des principaux programmes phares avant même la tenue de la 21e conférence des partis COP21 de Paris. Nous nous félicitons donc des efforts en cours du Centre mondial pour l'adaptation et de son ambition de répondre à la demande d'adaptation et de mise en œuvre pour l'Afrique. Permettez-moi aussi d'exprimer ma reconnaissance à nos États membres et à nos partenaires, à BAD en particulier, pour leur soutien en matière de lutte contre le changement climatique et des efforts en vue de construire une véritable résilience. Mesdames, Messieurs, vivement, que toutes les promesses se réalisent concrètement pour faire face à l'urgence climatique en Afrique qui est aggravée par cette terrible pandémie, la COVID-19. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Thank you so much, Chairman Faki of the African Union Commission, indeed, for your resolve, for your leadership, for your commitment to drive this agenda forward. It's concrete, it's bold, it's actionable. That's precisely what we need moving forward. To accelerate time also today in our meeting, I would like to invite three speakers in a row, all from Europe. First, we're going to listen to Vice President Timmermans of the European Commission. Then we move from Brussels to Stockholm to Minister Olsen Frit from Sweden. And then from Stockholm, we move to London, Alok Sharma, COP26 president. Let's listen to the leaders from Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. 
The climate and biodiversity crises are global crises. Their effects are felt by all. And the only true solution will be a joint solution. As it stands, 20 countries are responsible for 80% of emissions. From Europe, we're working to get all major emitters join our commitment to net zero emissions. We need this commitment to avoid the worst. But we also need to prepare for the unavoidable. Climate change is here, and its impact is accelerating. Stronger international partnerships are a key part of the EU's new climate adaptation strategy. As our sister continent, Africa is a clear priority. We want a partnership of equals based on African needs and necessities. Africa has great potential to leapfrog fossil fuel-based development and provide next generations a happy, healthy life. On the flip side, gearing up adaptation efforts in Africa is crucial to avert economic losses, conflict and human suffering. That's why we're supporting action via the African Adaptation Initiative, the United Nations Development Programme and the Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility. Altogether, the EU has mobilized some 3.4 billion euros for adaptation in Africa since 2014. Moving forward, we should boost those actions that bring triple wins on the recovery from COVID-19, on tackling climate change and on economic development. The Africa Adaptation Acceleration Programme can be instrumental in this regard. We're building on strong foundations and we're committed to strengthening our cooperation even more. We're all together in this fight, so let's get going. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, climate change brings catastrophic consequences for human life, health and security everywhere on our planet. The poorest and most vulnerable people are hardest hit when livelihood and entire ecosystems are under threat. As we face this climate crisis, we must stop with activities leading to high emissions and enable a transition from fossils to renewables and build on nature-based solutions. We must scale up investments in biodiversity and resilience, and we must better analyze climate-related security risks, such as drought, flooding and sea level rise and how it affects human security. What we need to do is summed up by two words, mitigation and adaptation. And we need progress on both. We need ambitious national plans and hold each other accountable for how we live up to the Paris Treaty and the Sustainable Development Goals. And in this context, commitments for support to adaptation in Africa is critical. There is a momentum as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic we need to mobilize to build back better and greener, and it requires both political and financial determination and imagination. So what does this mean for development? Well, first, we need to formulate clear, transparent and climate smart regulations that foster transformative change and a green recovery. We need to scale up solutions and maximize impact. Second, while important, climate financing alone is not enough. All investments need to be climate and environmentally sustainable. Climate and environment needs to be incorporated in national budgets and planning tools. Incorporating climate, environment and biodiversity will also lead to better economic sustainability. The economic benefits of mitigating and adapting far outweigh the costs. Third, we need to work with private industry and the energy sector to ensure they are fossil free and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, while at the same time mobilizing private sector financing for climate action. Last year, Sweden doubled its support for the Green Climate Fund with an 850 million US dollar contribution, out of which half is for adaptation and more donors need to join. Here, Sweden welcomes the important step made by the African Development Bank to focus equally on adaptation and mitigation. Finally, don't underestimate the power of the people. We see a growing number of people taking the streets, asking us, policymakers and politicians, to take action. Climate change is the biggest threat we face, so let's take their demands seriously. We will be judged for our actions, not our promises. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be speaking to you today on the critical issue of how we prioritize adaptation as we fight climate change. On my recent visits from Kenya to Gabon, from Egypt to Nigeria, I have been struck by the enormous challenges African nations face from the twin threats of COVID and climate. And yet there are fantastic initiatives across the continent to enable communities to adapt in the face of climate change. The international community must support this work. It must make finance available and give every country the chance to place adaptation at the heart of their COVID response. This is uh, central to the UK COP26 presidency. Adaptation and finance are two of our top priorities. So I'm very pleased that the UK government is supporting the African Union Green Recovery Action Plan, which I discussed with African Union colleagues in Ethiopia recently. And the UK is also supporting the Life AR initiative to help to get finance to the local level. And it is fantastic to see the African Development Bank's leadership with its own African Adaptation Acceleration Programme and, of course, its commitment to spend 50% of climate finance on adaptation. And yet, in this critical year for climate action, I urge the bank to go further, to set a date by which all its operations will be fully aligned with the Paris Agreement and to work with countries to develop green, inclusive and resilient COVID recovery programmes. To spur progress on both finance and adaptation, last week the UK COP26 presidency held a climate and development ministerial meeting. Developed countries and MDBs committed to action ahead of COP26 on issues like debt, uh, on access to finance and response to climate impacts. And at this event, the UK and Fiji agreed to initiate an Aligning Finance and Ambition Task Force. I'm absolutely focused on delivering on the results of that meeting to ensure a green, resilient COVID recovery can be truly global. And I'm committed to getting discussions going ahead of the negotiations in Glasgow so we arrive armed with shared solutions. And we've got events planned on finance, on the global goal on adaptation, and on the Santiago Network for Loss and Damage, which we aim to operationalize by COP26. I hope that the leaders listening today, and indeed your teams, will participate in these meetings to give the negotiations the best chance of success. And I urge you to join the Adaptation Action Coalition, which the UK co-chairs with Egypt. The aim is to scale up action on adaptation around the world, particularly in water, healthcare and infrastructure. Together, we can build real momentum around adaptation and finance in the run-up to COP26, supporting those clean, resili resilient recoveries and creating a lasting legacy on which the African presidency of COP27 can be built. Thank you. Well, what a strong message from Europe indeed to partner with Africa and to drive from here to COP26. We have now with us as a last speaker, but certainly not as the least important one, is a critical friend of Africa, a critical partner to the African Development Bank and a critical partner to the Global Center on Adaptation. Patricia Espinoza, Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC. So Patricia, thank you for joining us today. What needs to be done between now and Glasgow? How can we support you in this endeavor? What are your departing thoughts, uh, Patricia? Thank you for, for this uh, invitation, uh, dear Patrick. Excellencies, esteemed colleagues, there is no doubt that 2021 is a pivotal year for the climate and perhaps it is the most important since the adoption of the Paris Agreement. That is why, from a UN climate change perspective, it has been most gratifying to listen to today's dialogue. I have been inspired, I have been encouraged by the strong messages from this extraordinary group of leaders, uh, by the clarity with which they see the steps that need to happen in order to go forward in our uh, process. I have been encouraged, and I think we all should be encouraged by the Secretary General's determination to make COP26 a success and to really get the message out that the transformation needed is already on its way. We all know that climate adaptation and resilience are a vital component on our path to a successful COP26 at the end of this year. 
we can take some encouragement that at least 125 out of 154 will also be foundational discussions and decisions in the lead up to Glasgow. To that end, it remains absolutely critical for parties to fulfill their pre-2020 commit commitments by submitting stronger NDCs and, of course, the pledge by the developed nations to mobilize 100 billion annually by 2020 to support the efforts of developing countries is paramount and cannot be ignored. I would like to underline that this has to be recognized as an investment in the future for all, not others. It is in our self-interest. These were the promises made and these are the promises that must be kept. COP26 needs to deliver a clear signal on the availability of finance as the key to unlock ambition and to enable the urgently needed adaptation action on the ground. We need to deliver on several fronts, closing the gap between adaptation and mitigation financing, increasing support to adaptation actions, including for the most vulnerable as committed under the convention and the Paris Agreement, and specifically increasing support to adaptation financing for example, through the work of the Adaptation Fund, which is a proven enabler of concrete adaptation projects that can be replicated by other funds. We must also wrap up outstanding negotiations and fully implement the Paris Agreement, including finalizing rules under Article 6 regarding emissions and the use of international carbon markets, as well as the rules governing transparency. It is only by unleashing the agreement's full potential that we will address the climate change and at the same time, help the world build forward from COVID-19. It is also critical that all voices be heard and no solution is left behind. The only way to accomplish this is through inclusive multilateralism. In this regard, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program is an incredibly positive step forward and I congratulate the ADB and the Global Center for Adaptation Africa in making the, its development a reality. We can and we must build forward to achieve a transformational change in global climate policy and action. Today's deliberation show we are on the right track to reach our collective goals for a greener and more prosperous world. But we must translate all these commitments, all these ideas that we have heard today into specific outcomes, specific deliverables at COP26. So I'm very, very happy today, very much encouraged by what we have heard. I am happy to say that we at UN Climate Change stand ready to support the efforts to translate today's discussions in specific outcomes for a very, very successful COP26 and beyond. Over to you, Patrick. Well, thank you so much, uh, dearest uh, Patricia, for your strong words, but also your continued leadership on this agenda. Indeed, Africa need that needs to be at the forefront in Glasgow. We stand ready to work with you, with the United Kingdom, and with Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, in the coming months to put this on the agenda uh, indeed. Thank you again, uh, Patricia. I wish you well. I would like now to turn for the last word to not only my friend, but actually also my mentor and my big brother, President Adesina. We have had an extraordinary conversation in the last few hours. I think it, it's fair to say that it's even exceeded our expectations. Any departing views from you, uh, Mr. President? What's your takeaway? 
Well, thank you very much, uh, you know, my, my brother Patrick, and uh, thank you for a wonderful job that you have done in moderating so well. I think it's, uh, it's very humbling to have all the heads of the states here, all the global leaders here on this agenda that's actually so, so crucial. And what are some of the takeaways uh, are, are, are from us is that it's clear that we have massive support for the African Adaptation Acceleration uh, Program. It's key for Africa's uh, uh, adaptation. And of course, it's very clear that it's also a very strong link and alliance and partnership between this African Ac uh, Adaptation Acceleration Program and the African uh, Adaptation Initiative of the African Union. So the partnership is very, very strong. We have incredible support, Patrick, uh, from our heads of state and leaders. You had there every single voice uh, throughout this conversation. And it is very clear we also have comprehensive support uh, from across the world, from global leaders uh, for this initiative and, of course, uh, for Africa. Uh, we can see that when um, Secretary General, uh, former Secretary General Banking was started, he talked about the need to have step change in adaptation, a step change in finance, step change in partnership. We saw step changes in these conversations on those areas that the co-chair actually talked about. And so we could see the need for us to have action, the need for partnership, the need to work at scale, absolutely critical, and of course, the need for us to achieve clear impact on the ground. And of course, one of the things that I'm taking away is that we absolutely have to make sure that we put the resources behind the uh, African Adaptation Acceleration Program, and as you rightly said, in the look forward towards COP26 uh, uh, in Glasgow, but of course to Africa's COP, that it becomes fully uh, financed uh, with the additional $12.5 billion mobilized to be able to deploy and to have the kind of impact that we expect from the program. Let me close by simply stating uh, what the uh, UN Secretary General uh, uh, Guterres said. He said, let's turn ambition to reality. And so basically what we have in ahead of us is to turn that ambition to reality. And he also said determination, which was actually critical. And you and I are very determined people. So we're gonna to continue to work to make sure that we work with all the partners to turn this ambition collectively that we have into a reality. And I'm absolutely confident that together with that determination, with the resources, Africa will have what it takes to adapt and Africa will thrive as Africa tries, the rest of the world will also try. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for these very inspiring words and concluding on, the, on, on this event. We just learned also adaptation, action as we speak. We've managed to try to get connection with Rwanda and Zambia because we would like to get them in. Um, can we, I'm looking to the producer, can we bring them in? The final thoughts from Rwanda, from the minister. Zambia. We would like to give the opportunity to give the platform for all leaders, the whole continent, bring them in. Zambia is coming in very quickly. But we speak in Mr. Minister, can we hear you? Mr. Chanda, Minister. On behalf of His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Zambia, Dr. Edgar Chagwalungu, I wish to submit the following statements on behalf of Zambia. The impact of climate change in Africa has manifested itself through extreme weather events, such as droughts and unprecedented flooding, coupled with pest invasions on crops. Zambia has not been spared from these events. In recent years, we have experienced drought and dry spells, seasonal flash floods and extreme temperatures. These extreme events have put pressure on African government budgets, including Zambia, through unplanned expenditures and have caused the diversion of resources away from other development priorities. In addition, the poor have typically been most affected by the damage caused to infrastructure and disruptions to livelihoods. Furthermore, the frequency of such extreme weather events and associated disruptions has affected the development agenda of governments, derailed the fight to reduce poverty and improve livelihoods in Africa, and slowed GDP growth, which in Zambia was half of the projection of 4% in 2019. 
The exchange rate has also depreciated by about 50% from 2019, while inflation increased to 22.8% in March 2021, from 11.7% that ends December 2019. Climate change adaptation programs offer solutions that mitigate the negative effects. In Zambia, government is already undertaking measures through various initiatives with support from cooperating partners. These projects aim to enhance the adaptive capacity of vulnerable farmers through smart agricultural practices. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the gains from such projects. The resources required to mitigate the effects of the pandemic and contain its spread has compounded the challenge faced by African governments, including Zambia. We now not only have to mobilize resources for populations affected by extreme weather events, but also have to mobilize resources to ensure that these populations are not devastated by the coronavirus. Further, revenue collections were below target by 8.7% in 2020, while expenditures increased due to interventions on COVID by 14%. Growth in 2020 contracted by 3%. In this regard, we encourage our partners to fully operationalize initiatives such as green financing and green bonds in countries such as Zambia to close the financing gap, especially during a time when countries are faced with liquidity challenges. Two, it is in this vein that we commend the African Development Bank and the Global Center on Adaptation on the launch of the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program and urge others to do the same. The success of this initiative largely depends on us. I thank you. So much, Mr. Ch Minister Chanda, on behalf of President Lungo of Zambia. This is a very powerful word. It's also an excellent way of concluding this meeting uh, today. And apologies sincerely for not being able to connect to Rwanda. Their message is not being lost. We will make sure to reconnect with them and get that message out when we move forward. Today, and I'm extremely humbled by this very strong dialogue. I believe I also speak on behalf of President Adishina and President Bongo and former uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. This has been an inspiration for action. I'm humbled, we are humbled, by the African leaders and heads of states and government for their commitment for action. We know what it takes, we've listened very carefully. We stand ready to support you in that journey. In the last few hours, we have heard dozens of people joining the conversation online. The excitement is tremendous. People want to connect, people want to join. This is an inclusive agenda. Let's leave no one behind. Let's conclude today's meeting with a short voice from the youth. We have Deti Bonse with us from Ghana. Thank you very much indeed. We will be back. Thank you. Africa is the world's youngest continent with 6% of us under the age of 25. Our future will be dependent on how we adapt to climate change. Not forgetting that the jobs of tomorrow will depend on how we respond to the climate effects today. Africa's young people have the potential and passion to protect the continent from the great perils of climate change. Our generation stands ready to make Africa stronger and more resilient.